All right, we'll go ahead and get started and people will be filtering in. Um, happy to get day two of the first International Invasive Species Climate Change Conference in this virtual space. So if you uh, were able to attend yesterday, there were quite a few baseball references, including this reference for Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. And this was the last minute addition with this uh, little banner about how many attended and I forgot what a zero. We had over a thousand uh, folks attend at some point or another in the day. And we were really, really impressed with the attendance and the participation and appreciate you all. The other thing to point out about this is, you know, we really felt a sense of community as we all came together um, for these talks. We're doing this conference about climate change in reducing our carbon footprint. Not everyone can attend international meetings. We also increased in accessibility. Um, so here you can see just from yesterday's Menti poll, just where folks were coming from. We had really widespread attendance, but of course the abundance of folks in, in North America, but I'm really happy to see this spread and hopefully we can get even more folks represented in this map. So the Menti poll was shared in the chat, but also you can scan this QR code and let us know where you're from. And there's also a few questions in there that we're going to use in a session later on sort of crowdsourcing the community. So this was sort of the brainchild of the Cross-Risk Network or the Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Network. And what does that look like? Uh, this map here, you can see the distribution. We have Northwest, Pacific, North Central, Northeast, Southeast, working to fill in the gaps. And i um, happy to, to report that Canada is building a risk network as well. And here we are, your organizing uh, committee, Giancarlo, myself, Tony Lynn, and Elliot. You'll see us around today uh, as we move through our program. And then just to acknowledge our partners, we really appreciate the help that we've gotten from these folks. Specifically want to shout out to the North American Invasive Species Management Association for helping host the event. And I do want to give an even more special shout out to Tegan Wilmot for her help with the registration promotion and all things Zoom. We really, really appreciate your help with this. Um, I sit on the board of directors for NASMA and have found this to be a really great community of invasive species man management professionals. Um, so if you're interested, there's opportunities to participate um, with the group, uh, including the annual meeting coming up in Missoula, Montana. And uh, just a little inside, I'm the co-chair for the board development committee. So if you're interested in getting involved in leadership, um, just shoot me an email. And so here's just an overview of the schedule for today. Uh, we have uh, the plenary session followed by management success stories, and those will be lightning talks. We'll take a short break and then come back for managing invasive species in a cl changing climate, really drilling down on island ecosystems. Um, and then this crowdsourcing the future, um, this is where that data really comes in handy uh, from the Menti poll. And then uh, merging research, this will be lightning talks, and then we'll round it out with closing remarks. Okay, now we'll just pivot to the plenary session. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers, giving a talk titled Insights from the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, Assessment on Invasive Alien Species and Their Control. If you've heard the term IPBES, this is the shorter way to say a part of that. This is presented jointly by Dr. Helen Roy and Dr. Peter Stowett. Helen is an ecologist at the United Kingdom Center for Ecology and Hydrology and a professor in ecology at the University of Exeter. Helen co-leads a large research group within the biodiversity science area. She leads global collaborations to deliver high impact research to understand and predict the effects of biological invasions and other drivers of global environmental change on biodiversity and ecosystem functioning using large scale and long-term species distribution and abundance data sets. Prevention, early detection and rapid response are critical to the management of invasive non-native species. And Helen's work developing collaborative approaches for horizon scanning to inform prevention have achieved international recognition and application. 
Peter's main areas of research uh, expertise include international relations and law, global environmental politics and human rights. He's especially interested in critical perspectives on the many nuanced intersections between these themes. Current research focuses on biodiversity conservation policy, transnational environmental crime, marine pollution prevention, climate justice, and Canadian-American environmental relations. He has also worked extensively on genocide and war crimes prevention and punishment. And so with that, let's please give a warm welcome to Drs. Roy and Stoet. Take it away when you are ready. Great. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And it's wonderful for the two of us to be here with you all and to share the outcomes of this um, invasive alien species assessment. So I'm just going to share my screen. It's wonderful to be with you. And um, thank you so much for the kind invitation um, to join you all. So we're delighted to be able to share with you the IPBES assessment report on invasive alien species and their control. I'm going to give the first part of the presentation, then I'll hand over um, to Peter for the latter part of the presentation. And we're looking forward to all of your um, questions and comments um, afterwards as well. So Peter and I are co-chairs alongside Anibal Pachard from Chile. And this assessment for IPBES, and I don't know how familiar people are with the IPBES assessments, but they um, take place over sort of varying lengths of times. And it just happens that this assessment took place over four years, which was quite a long time for an IPBES assessment. But of course, we had the pandemic in the middle of it. So it was developed over four years. We had three author meetings. We had our first meeting all together in person in Japan just before the pandemic began. So that was 2019. And then we moved online for all of our meetings and had um, a final couple of um, hybrid meetings um, with our lead authors. And then finally, a meeting in person um, with the coordinating lead authors to develop the summary for policymakers. I don't know how familiar everyone is with the various structures of these assessments, and we can take questions around that afterwards. But hopefully, it will be reasonably clear to you as we go through. But an important part of the assessment process is the external review process. And maybe you took part in that review process. And if you did, a huge thanks to you, because really the reviewers' comments that we received added immensely to the quality and the content of the assessment. And we were really very, very grateful for the thousands and thousands of comments that we addressed throughout the process of developing the assessment report. Right at the end of the assessment period, we had an additional review um, by the government just before we went to the IPBES plenary. And the IPBES plenary that we presented um, this assessment at was um, last September. And there were about 143 governments um, in the room. And we had this amazing opportunity to spend time with them. I think it was something like 40 hours of negotiations going line by line through this report to get their approval of it. And we're delighted that there was unanimous approval from the governments. We had an amazing multidisciplinary team to work with, including 86 experts and many contributing authors spanning the world. And each and every one of them made an incredible contribution to the assessment. And that multidisciplinary nature is extremely important, as is that global nature, in terms of bringing so many different perspectives and um, so much expertise um, into the process. People gave up a huge amount of time, many of them adding additional time as volunteers to contribute to this process. We went through many, many documents to produce this assessment, 13,000 in depth. But additionally, for example, we had an assessment looking at scenarios and models where we reviewed 33,000 um, reports. So incredible amount of information that we um, drew on, but it wasn't just peer reviewed scientific information. We also took information from various values and knowledge systems, drawing on the scientific and gray literature, and really importantly, um, engaging with indigenous peoples and local communities. And if there are questions there, Peter can provide a lot more information on the processes that we went through. But for me, as a natural scientist, it was an incredible privilege to be able to attend one of the dialogue workshops and really learn a huge amount from the insights that were provided through that process. 
But in addition to those dialogue workshops, we also put out a call for contributions and collaborated with um, indigenous and local knowledge experts and holders across the expert team and also as contributing authors that really added enormously to the assessment. So here is a photo of us all right at the very start of the process in Japan. And little did we know at that point that we were going to be moving online for the most of the assessment process after that. But actually, it did work tremendously well. And we had an incredibly engaged team of experts that got involved with the assessment and also brought on board many of these contributing authors. And I would also like to acknowledge that we had an amazing technical support unit who are based in Japan at IGES, the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies. And they really were instrumental in terms of us delivering this assessment to time and following all the necessary procedures within the ITBES um, process. So we're extremely appreciative of them for their support. So that's giving you a little bit of information in terms of the process. And again, as I said, we're happy to address any questions. And I really encourage people to get involved in future assessments. And particularly, for example, when there's calls for review out to look, if you're um, an expert on biological invasions, you can contribute on those aspects within the forthcoming assessments that are live across ITBES. So now we're going to come to the content of the assessments. And I know that this is a, a conference all about invasive alien species, but I think it is still useful to begin talking about it from the definition perspective and also acknowledging that back in 2019, the ITBES Global Assessment was published and that highlighted invasive alien species as one of the five main drivers of biodiversity loss. Of course, alongside climate change, which is another important component um, of this conference, and also land and sea use change, exploitation of um, natural resources, and also pollution. And we're going to try and pick up on the climate change elements as we go through as well. There was a lot within the report around the interactions between invasive alien species and climate change. But just to be really clear, alien species are animals, plants and other organisms have been introduced by human activities to new regions of the world where they wouldn't have otherwise naturally occurred. And that human activities part is extremely important within the definition that's been used um, for this assessment. The invasive alien species are a subset of those alien species, and they are the subset that are known to have established and spread and having a negative impact on nature, and in some cases also on people as well. So this is one of the graphics from our summary for policymakers, and we spent an awful lot of time working on this graphic and then indeed through the um, process um, of negotiation with all of the governments, we spend an awful lot of time discussing the definitions here. And it's really apparent that I think that that's why it's important to share these definitions at the start of a talk because there is divergence in the terminologies and definitions that have been used. But one of the things that we're hoping is that now through the IBES assessment, maybe there can be a convergence around these definitions. And essentially, we um, on the left of this figure are highlighting the biological invasion process with transport, introduction, establishment and spread, and noting that we haven't got impact on this part um, of the graphic. But on the other side, we have the status of the different species and some definitions there for native species, alien species, established alien species, and invasive alien species. And that's where we brought the impact aspect in on the invasive alien species being the subset of the established alien species and that they're having these negative impacts on biodiversity and ecosystems, but many of them also have impacts on nature's contributions to people and also um, good quality of life. So going into a little bit more detail in terms of the findings of the report and some of the headline figures, so people in nature are threatened by invasive alien species in all regions of Earth. And we pulled together all of the information that was found on established alien species into one big data set that includes about 37,000 established alien species introduced by human activities worldwide. We're also able to see from the temporal trends in that information that about 200 new alien species are being introduced um, every year. 
of this huge number, the 37,000, we have evidence of impacts for about 3,500 of those, and they are the ones that are termed invasive alien species. So just to point you into the, the chapters of the assessment, which are now all available online, chapter two provides a summary of the um, status and trends of um, alien species and includes the information around this figure for the 37,000 and links to all of the um, data management reports. It gives even more information on that. And then chapter four covers um, the information on the impacts. And chapter four went through a really um, systematic process to look for the evidence of impacts, both um, positive and negative. And, and this will become relevant a little bit um, further on. But this is where we get this information that 3,500 of these established alien species um, have negative impacts on nature and in some cases also on people. And then of this big data set, um, there's also evidence for more than 2,300 invasive alien species that are found on the lands of indigenous peoples across all regions of Earth. The graphic um, to the side here is one again from the summary of policymakers and essentially just showing that in many cases species can have impacts across all of these different categories for nature, nature's contributions to people and also good quality of life and just highlighting a few examples um, of the many, many examples that are covered through case studies um, within the assessment report. So another of the, the headline figures, and just to again point you to the chapter, we cover the policy aspect, particularly in chapter six, but I will say chapter one also has a lot of introductory material to all of these different areas, but chapter six includes the review part for the policies. And really what comes out from that is that current policies have been insufficient in managing biological invasions and preventing and controlling invasive alien species. So although most countries, about 80%, have targets for the management of biological invasions within natural bio national biodiversity strategies and action plans, 83% of the countries do not have any national legislation or regulations directed specifically towards the prevention and control of invasive alien species. And perhaps quite concerningly, nearly half of all countries 45% do not invest in the management of invasive alien species. So just to give a few of the, the figures on impact, and again, we could give um, many more because this chapter four is extremely rich in terms of this information. But when we look at global species extinction, 60% have been caused either solely by invasive alien species or invasive alien species have been a contributing factor alongside um, other drivers of change. So for example, the combination of land use change and invasive alien species. In terms of the global annual costs, we use the database and the data set Invercost that you may have seen or heard of. And this is a database that's been kept up to date and online on a very, very regular basis. And you can visit their website to explore in more detail those costs. And we're great, very grateful to the team who worked on this, including contributing authors, to give us this figure of more than 423 billion being the estimated global annual cost of biological invasions in 2019. I think it's important to say that although this seems a, a huge number, it's really important to note that as the invasive cost team explained to us, it's like the tip of an iceberg, that there are many, many intangible costs that are not captured within that figure. For example, the time that someone's having to put in to clear invasive weeds, for example, on their land, many of these costs will not be captured within this figure. So we anticipate that this really is just the tip of the iceberg. And then coming to these two percentages, so this database that was created within chapter four, looking at evidence of impacts, and of course, it's important to say that all invasive alien species have a negative impact on nature. So that's 100% of them will have a negative impact on nature. But if we look at all of the impacts that were found from this extensive structured search for evidence of impacts, 85% of the impacts on nature and good quality of life are negative. So there were very, very few positive impacts found on nature or good quality of life. And similarly, for nature's contributions to people, 
80% of those are negative with very few um, positive impacts found. And we're very happy um, to discuss these figures from um, the databases in more detail. And as I said, chapter four has um, all of the information um, within it as well and links towards um, data management reports and, and the, the processes they went through to capture that information. So I, I definitely get the gloomy part of the talk in terms of these huge figures in terms of these negative impacts. And also to say that when we look at sort of temporal trends in the number of established alien species over time across all regions, we can see that the threats from invasive alien species are increasing significantly in every region for all of the taxa. And we're seeing these really quite dramatic increases over the last 50 years. I'm now going to hand across to you, Peter, for the next part of the talk. Thanks, Helen. And uh, yeah, thanks to the organizers uh, for inviting us. And I was able to watch some of the presentations yesterday and really enjoyed it. And it struck me that uh, I go back and look at the assessment just in terms of the climate change. And wow, it's all over the assessment. There's no doubt that climate is a central issue. And in fact, uh, I'll read very briefly. A key central issue. We have several key central issues that we identify in chapter one, but is the present and future impact of global environmental change. Um, the underlying direct and indirect anthropogenic drivers of change, not only on the spread and introduction of success of invasive alien species, but also on options for management, climate change and land and sea use, but also pollution, chemical, plastics, debris, etc., ocean acidification and other systems level direct drivers of change in nature are currently shaping the Anthropocene and driving in particular the loss of biodiversity. Invasive alien species have long been identified as one of the primary drivers of this global biodiversity crisis, and they interact with other drivers of global environmental change to exacerbate it, which I think is an important point that comes up that invasive alien species themselves are drivers of these global uh, changes that we're seeing, including climate change. So it is a reciprocal relationship, unfortunately. So people are at the heart of the problem. We want to stress this. I, I understand some of the material you're dealing with in this conference is, is more or less about unassisted uh, colonization, or I forget the exact term was used yesterday. But our study was really focused on, and, and we had a mandate to do this. It's called a scoping document, which um, is negotiated by countries. And we were mandated specifically to look at invasive civilian species that were, as Helen said, def defined by the presence of human activity. Okay. So the transport, introduction, establishment, and spread, you know, all, all the key elements, I guess, in, involved in the invasion curve, human beings can be found right there, whether they're doing this intentionally or unintentionally, I should stress. And of course, historically, unintentionally has been a very popular mode of, <laughs> of transport for invasive civilian species. We certainly found that this is an increasing trend as all the graphs in the pre previous slide indicated. If things remain unchanged by 2050, the total number of alien species globally is expected to be about one third higher than in 2005. And recalling that around 10% of alien species turn out to be invasive, this is in fact quite a frightening figure. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, very complex interactions between invasive alien species and other drivers of change. And the ones that we focused on, we, we focus on, on, on so many, it's, it's difficult to summarize it all, but um, certainly demographic, economic, land and sea use change are increasing and these will amplify the threats and impacts. And climate change will, as I said before, be a major cause of future increases in the risk of invasive alien species. I think just as there's consensus that climate change is caused by the human hand, so are we determined to uh, present our finding that invasive alien species are being caused by the human hand and uh, that these two um, elements of change will interact with each other and both are increasing as we move along. So while people are at the heart of the problem, we often like to say that people are at the heart of the solution as well. And I think one thing that came out of this, and I know Helen will agree, out of this assessment process, again, four years, top experts from all countries, it was almost, I think, consensus that, you know, as, as tough as things look, 
we ended up with a fairly optimistic perspective. You know, we are looking at solutions that have been applied throughout the last several decades, right? Research is being done like never before. And this conference, of course, is testament to that and the great researchers that are present and have put this conference together. This, I think, is Annie Bell, is it not, Helen, in the top <laughs> picture, which is one of our co-chairs, and he's out doing his work near the Andes in Chile, which is where he's located. I always joke and say that's not him cleaning the, the boat hall below, but that, that is certainly a, a major form of transmission of invasive alien species in, in the uh, marine biota. There are three basic management options that come out, and this is really chapter five. If you're interested in management, I know many people here are engaged in management day to day. If you weren't involved in the review process, or even if you were, please take a look at chapter five because it really focuses on management. And uh, this includes management of pathways of introduction and spread. We talked a bit about this yesterday too in the, in the conference, I recall. And this has to take place, of course, both internationally and nationally. The management of target invasive alien species at either local or landscape scales. And lastly, site-based or ecosystem-based management. And we don't come out and say one of these is better than the other. Um, that's not the role of IPIS. The role of IPIS is to present a panoply of options to policymakers uh, and the public. Um, I will say that I believe uh, strongly that all three are absolutely essential. Um, but I think that the climate change um, issues that are raised by climate change do certainly uh, amplify the need for C, site-based or ecosystem-based management, because the ecosystems themselves are changing, right? So it's, it's essential that climate is brought into that, whether that's in islands, polar regions, mountain regions. We identified those, I think, of uh, especially having some being impacted by climate change. So this is a conceptual diagram of management invasion continuum. We won't have time to go over this at any length here. I can just say that, again, you know, it's available. The top is for terrestrial and closed water systems, and the bottom is for marine and connected water systems, which are the two categories that we used for the purposes of the assessment. As you can see, there are solutions, and they are being implemented, whether it's technological advances or simply new management techniques. They're being implemented around the world and it's very exciting. However, there is a lack of equity when it comes to resources available to implement these. And this is one reason why we're so keen on spreading the word of the assessment and making sure that people realize this is a global problem and it, it will involve some distribution of resources in order to try and tackle it. So we can come back to this if, if it's wanted, but for now we must, I think we should just move on. Um, prevention and preparedness are the most cost-effective options. We stress this again and again and again. Um, prevention can be achieved through pathway management, including strictly enforced import controls, pre-border, border and post-border biosecurity. Biosecurity is a big phrase that we use quite often um, because we're looking really at impacts on human health as well. So that really fits within what most governments consider the biosecurity uh, envelope. <clears throat> um, and climate change, I don't have to tell you, um, is particularly troublesome when it comes to the spread of disease and so forth. Um, and measures to address <clears throat> escape from confinement. Prevention is particularly important on islands. And we do stress that as one of our key issues. It is also critical in marine and connected water systems where most attempts at eradicating or containing invasive alien species have mostly failed. And that, that is just the, the reality of it. I know that some closed water systems, there have been more successful eradication efforts, but when it comes to eradicating a um, marine invasion, for example, in coastal areas, extremely difficult, very little evidence that it can actually work. So prevention is what is, is the key uh, term. And the result of that belief, of course, is a, also a belief that sustained inadequate funding, capacity building, technical and scientific cooperation, transfer of technology, monitoring, quarantine and inspection facilities are necessary for effective prevention measures. This has to take place on an international scale. And this whole question of capacity building, of course, was so important in the plenary, the IPIS plenary in Bonn where we negotiated 
with 140 governments to come up with the final summary of policymakers. Um, I can't stress enough how capacity building was expressed as a priority, especially by countries in the global south. So we talk about different management options in the, in the report, of course, eradication. Um, it has been successful, especially for small and slow spreading populations, and especially in isolated ecosystems. And many successful examples, and again, I'd refer you to the assessment, but in uh, small uh, um, islands, for example, containment and control can be an effective option for invasive alien species that cannot be eradicated for various reasons. Most attempts, again, in marine and connected water systems are largely ineffective. And then we have the recovery of ecosystem functions and nature's contributions to people, which can be achieved through adaptive management, including ecosystem restoration. And I really want to stress that phrase, adaptive management. I think that is absolutely key. We heard a lot about adaptation yesterday to climate change, but adaptive management, absolutely key when it comes to how we deal with not just prevention, but also right, if prevention fails, as, as this slide suggests, other efforts to contain and control. Yes, yeah, so chapter six does deal with governance in more detail and various facets of governance, everything from public participation to making sure that different government departments are working hand in hand, much like the National Invasive Species Council is trying to do in the U.S., we know that, uh, of course, in December 2022, we had the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, and that Target 6 was focused on invasive alien species. Helen and I were there and sat through a lot of those negotiations. I think the key here is that the international community has made a commitment. Um, and so we have to get this done, and we can get this done if we use the right resources. Um, in terms of integrated governance, this is our tree. Um, it's a very famous tree because it took us quite a while to get it uh, together. But um, basically, on the top, we have the strategic actions that are necessary. And at the bottom, we have um, the properties of governance systems. I think it's a really key figure that comes out of the assessment. And I know we're all using it wherever we go. You might just say that it's, it's fairly generic and that it could be applied to many environmental issues. So I think it can double up if you're interested in using it for any of, of your work. So again, the conclusion, I think it's self-evident by now, I've already said this, these are attainable goals, significant long-term benefits for people in nature. And just to stress that point, yeah, what we tried to get across at Plenary and elsewhere, dealing with invasive alien species will make it easier for governments to deal with the other problems as well. So it's not sitting there in, in isolation. Right? So this is the first comprehensive global report. And we'd like to stress that point. The best available evidence, critical analysis, and options for governments, civil society, indigenous peoples, and local communities, the private sector, and all those seeking to address the issue of biological invasions. And how I mentioned before, indigenous peoples and local communities, we were able to, working in tandem with the UNESCO and IPIS, and the Convention on Biological Diversity in Montreal, we were able to hold a in-person, on-site focal group that came from people from all over the world, really, from Indigenous communities. And then we held two subsequent online separate groups uh, meeting for this as well. We also did, you'll notice in the assessment, if you look at it, we, I, I think, completed one of the first, if not the first, really global literature reviews on indigenous peoples and invasive alien species, um, looking at um, literature that uh, one way or the other, right, combine these elements. So I think that's sort of a first that can, comes out of the report as well. And we hope to subsequently publish something related to that more directly, um, but you can find it within the report as well in terms of the outcomes. And uh, next. Okay, yeah. So we have already discussed this. I think we can just move ahead. Just by the way, these are some of our lead authors at the Bond meeting. Just uh, absolutely fantastic group, as Helen mentioned. It was a real pleasure and honor to work with them. Um, okay, so, and I think we can, we can move on probably to the next one. 
Yeah, this one I did want to mention because it, it's really heartwarming, I think, for us to see, you know, the response. And part of this was to do with IPIS themselves, I think, that they've just got such a great communications machine under the direction of Rob Sproul and some, uh, a few other people. But the, the report will contribute to raise awareness on the issue. That's our hope. I think it already has, no doubt. We received coverage in every major newspaper you can imagine, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, the Times, I'm trying to think now of American and Canadian, Canadian Global Mail, Toronto Star, but elsewhere as, as well, of course, including The Guardian, and many, many non-English outlets, which is so important that this whole thing isn't based in English. So there are media articles in around 50 languages in over 100 countries, which came out when the report came out. But what we're noticing now is that when invasive alien species are being discussed in subsequent media articles and elsewhere, there's often mention of the IPIS assessment specifically, which is also nice to see. So far, we've already seen some impacts, I think, which have been significant. The revision of the national communication strategy to align with the language of the, from the assessment. Belgium undertook this. There's been official communications in Chile and France. Translation of the summary for policymakers. This is in process, but we are looking at Korean and, and Japanese um, versions coming out soon. Presentations and events organized by Japan, the UK, Finland, France, Norway, several African countries, the EU Parliament, and so forth. We were very fortunate also. We were in Tokyo recently, in fact, and presented to a G7 group and came out with a communique from there. Present in CBD, Substa, this I think is the picture of Helen speaking here, was at the Substa 25, which I know is a lengthy process. And another Substa won't be too, uh, won't be too long before we're at another one. Action from the Science Network, yes. So there's a new GBF task force, which will address the need for improved data and information. Another element that comes out of the assessment, by the way, we've got some great um, networks now in terms of spreading information about invasives, but we could certainly improve on that. Um, action from the private sector as well, and some funding opportunities that have explicitly mentioned the assessment in their justification or rationale. So in South Australia, there was a commitment over 2 million for the control of buffalo grass, for example, which mentioned the assessment, which was nice to see. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you so much. That was excellent. So we do have a few questions, a lot of them around impacts. I'm going to start selfishly asking one that I'm curious about. Thinking about the huge dollar amount in losses to invasive species, what was it, $430 billion for 2019 alone, what are your thoughts and perhaps maybe you can give some insights on the discussions as you built this report around folks who want to kind of balance an equation and weigh positive benefits to outweigh your negative detrimental uh, impacts. One of the phrases that we used often as well is that the cost of inaction would far, far exceed that cost of um, action. And actually, you know, by taking preventative action, that really is the way to begin to reduce those costs. In terms of the positive and the negative impacts, we are really at pains to point out it isn't some kind of equation. Those lists need to be kept very separate. You know, I think that there's no, no possibility of saying, okay, so we now have this positive impact, so somehow or other it outweighs that negative impact. The negative impacts are outweighing anything positive by a huge magnitudes um, greater. And so there isn't the possibility of this equation. And I saw that someone had written in the Q&A about some of the examples of these positive impacts. So a positive impact might be, for example, the introduction of a species as a biological control agent, an intentional introduction to control some kind of um, pest insect and some success around that. Um, and indeed, there have been many successes of biological control agents being introduced around the world. Unfortunately, there are, of course, the examples which have not been successful, such as, or have had huge negative impacts, such as the cane toad. But that would be a kind of example, I guess, you know, other positive examples towards people in terms of sort of ornamental plants and pets. 
there are positive impacts, of course, associated um, with those. And, and again, I think that we're really at pains to point out, it's not about stopping people doing the things that they love to do, it's about doing them with responsibility and to being a responsible pet owner, for example, or a responsible gardener. And also to highlight then that there are actions that each and every one of us can take to ensure biosecurity is as best as it possibly can be. So yeah, I hope that's not too long a way of answering your, your question. If I can add to that, that. So I think a lot of the positive impacts in many cases are after the fact. So if, if you look at the, the Asian carp, for example, in the Mississippi, right? That's a huge problem. I know that every North American is familiar with probably. And, and now, of course, yes, maybe you can harvest enough Asian carp and for the most part, ship it to China and there'll be a profit there for someone to make. So that gets that might get noted as a positive impact. But if you look at what the Asian carp is doing to the Mississippi, I think it's, it's extremely difficult to, you know, in, in your wildest dreams, really, to come up with a, a net balance in the positive. The other thing is with, with regard to the cost, as Helen said, you know, tip of the iceberg stuff, right? These are largely, you know, economic opportunity costs that get weighed. Some of the costs involved in responding, government responses and that sort of thing. But that's just monetary. And one of the things that IPIS likes to stress, of course, is that when we're dealing with biodiversity, we're dealing with our relationships with nature. And the fundamental changes that invasive species uh, can, can have on the landscape really do affect the human intellect, culture, even religious symbols. It just really comes out when you talk to indigenous people that are not only, you know, it's not that they're dependent on the land. We often use that phrase, they're dependent on the land. It's more that they, they interact with the land on a constant daily basis. And when it's changing this rapidly, it really changes things. So I would argue that, yeah, this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the costs. How would you weigh the positive impact when it comes to looking at the sociocultural impact of invasive species. I don't see many positives there right, at all. So if, if you look at it that way, and then there's the human health costs too, which in terms of you know pe people that are, are getting sick from diseases with, from which they were previously probably immune. And, and this, this relates to the climate change discussion as well, right? Sorry, not immune, but <laughs> not, not exposed to. How do you measure this in a positive way? It's very difficult for me. So it's overwhelmingly negative. We feel quite strong. Yeah, and I think that just to, to go to Peter's point, that the evidence as well around people were that, although they may well be adapting to invasive alien species, it was because of necessity, not through desire. And I think that was a, a really strong statement that came out through the report as well. And when it comes to thinking about any kind of positive impacts on nature, it's almost impossible to think about it in that way, because when you think about the complexity of the interactions when a new species arrives within an um, ecological system, kind of unraveling what's happening in terms of cascades and feedbacks within that ecological network, that's something that we really need to be exploring more. But for sure, the message is the impacts are overwhelmingly negative. Thank you. We have about three more minutes. I'm going to shift gears and ask a question about pathways. So uh, I think this is directed to Peter. Given your human rights background, I'm wondering if you see present or possible future conflict between pathway management for invasive species and clim climate adaptation responses for human climate refugees and human migration. Uh, yes, definitely. You know, there's no question that as people are forced to move, right, that this will increase societal friction. We've already established this, I think, quite clearly. And they will, in many cases, the concern is that they could bring species with them, right, that are exotic species or, or invasive alien species in many cases. I can't possibly deal with that question in three minutes as much as I'd like to. But we are really looking at a very problematic human rights scenario, I think. And the other thing, too, is this is really important. This is why we stress, I think, in Chapter 6 in particular, that the, the need for public participation in management, um, because many of these problems will come very suddenly. And we know that management is not effective if it doesn't involve public consultation. It's not even legal in many cases if it doesn't, and particularly as, as the rights of Indigenous peoples. 
right? So any sort of top-down coerced solutions in the long run usually fail anyway because they don't have that public support. But yeah, definitely, it's a great question. I just don't have the time to, to adjust just, it properly. I was no, just going to add that, and um, we haven't pointed to chapter three. I think it's the only one we didn't mention through the talk. And chapter three is a chapter on drivers. And it does have whole sections in relation to conflicts and also to aid and as indirect drivers in relation to invasive alien species. So really encourage people to take a look at that chapter too. Yeah, so I believe even military aid and post-disaster aid Mm. Uh, has in some cases been linked to uh, the spread of invasive species as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So there's a bit of a segue here to the what I believe will be a last question. Does anyone see the traditional ecological knowledge of indigenous communities playing any major roles other than gaining historical perspectives and uses of the land? In many ways, they are the experts themselves, you know, and th this knowledge, of course, it's indisputable. It's not so much that it's historical, I think it's very contemporary. They serve not only to, to protect the land, um, but also they're the eyes that are on it, you know, and, and so we really ignore that at our peril, I think. And so, yeah, I, I would say big time, yes, the answer is yeah. yes, but they need to have as well, I say they, but I don't mean to lump them all together, extremely different groups from different areas, but they need in many cases political protection to have some actual real influence. It can't just be a token you know, thank you for helping out. It's got to be genuine. So. I think Great. also, if, just to say from the review, there was also a huge amount of evidence for the insights that, that are provided and that we can learn in terms of other communities, in terms of management, for instance. So I think that kind of exchange of information and sharing of knowledge is phenomenally important in tackling biological invasions. Great. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your presentation. There's a couple more questions, if you wouldn't mind. Um, yeah. Pretty short and sweet, and we are going to pass it off to Matt. Hello, everyone. I'm Matt Brinka. I am the invasive species biologist for New York State Parks, and I'm going to be your host today for the Management Success Stories Lightning Talks, it's essentially a rodeo of presentations. So we're going to be moving pretty quick here, and you might miss something. Fear not, they are recorded and will be available after the conference. So presenters. You might see my mug pop up about a minute prior to when I'm going to have to probably reel you in and move it along. And to everyone who's watching, try to keep your hands and arms inside this little Zoom plane. If you have any questions, make sure you plop them in on the question and answer. We'll try to get to them at the end of each presentation. We might have a time for one question, but we might not. So we'll try to do our best to answer those questions. And are we ready to hear some success stories? I will take your silence as a yes. So what we are going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I am going to introduce our first speaker here. Joining us is Dr. Stuart Slattery, and I will be the first to say I often mispronounce names, so deal with me on that, but he's coming to us from Ducks Unlimited Canada, and he's the National Science Analyst at the Institute of uh, Wetland and Waterfall Research, and he'll be talking with us about the common threads in successful invasive species management. So please take it away when you are ready. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Um, I'm pitch hitting for Mark Gutney who put this together, but I will do my best to answer questions on this. And so what I'll be talking today, will be going through three cases that demonstrate the need for collaboration to tackle invasive species. The first example is in the Pacific coast uh, Northwest where there's various species of Spartana, which are an invasive intertidal grasses um, with inter invasion areas shown here in orange. Spartina can severely alter the impact of nearshore areas affecting habitat and species. Specifically, it eliminates valuable feeding and nursery habitat for fish and, and wildlife and invertebrates. Um, it replaces productive species, it alters soil nutrients, and it can alter estuarine hydrology. Specifically, Spartina can slow down water, it can trap sediments, it can cause the, the, the bottom to rise through accretion, and it can alter drainage patterns. And there are many dikes already below provincial standards for projected sea level rise, and there's the understanding that Spartana can exacerbate um, both the intensity and the frequency of tidal events. And so to, to deal with this invasive, the BC Spartana Working Group was established in 2004 to 
both detect and eradicate Spartina, working in collaboration with many partners, including Indigenous people. And the work has been paying off of the partnership here. On the left, you see that the major treatment for Spartina is through herbicide application. That application started in 2013 on Spartina Anglica. And you can see there was an immediate response in 2014. There was a little bit of hiccup in 2015 where they couldn't spray it. And then uh, that resumed. And then we saw this massive decline in Spartina until the pandemic came along when there was no more spraying for a little bit. But then that was resumed and... Um, it was, it's, it's clearly been successful in reducing them. The partnership approach has been um, critical to the success of this program. There's been a diverse interest and expertise from various levels of government, ENGOs, private sector, and so on, to ensure that the, uh, the best approaches were used for detection and eradication, and that this was done under due diligence with all values considered. And more specifically, the herbicide treatment required provincial permit that was led by the Ministry of Environment, and it required a special registration with the Pest Management Regulatory Agency. Um, the results were reported to BASF, which is a chemical company, and contributed the to the decision to allow Habitat, which is basically a, a massive pure, that's the herbicide, approval for use in Canada. Support for both the emergency registration and for the eventual full registration was in part due to the impact of this working group representing you know, the wide range of, of, of stakeholders, um, having demonstrated that alternative means weren't, weren't going to be successful in advocating for the severe threat that Spartina posed if it was left unchecked. That collaboration also fostered many relationships between working group members that have led to future partnerships projects um, to address climate change, including a living dike project, which basically starts to create salt marsh habitat for flood protection instead of using traditional hard infrastructure. The pre Spartina Working Group is comprised of three different components and uh, 23 different organizations. So I'll shift gears to central Manitoba to the Delta Marsh. This is a large inland coastal marsh on the south shore of Lake Manitoba has great ecological significance as a Ramsar site and an important bird and biodiversity area, and cultural significance first to the indigenous peoples and second to, to others as it became a famed waterfall hunting destination. Invasive carp is the problem here shown on the right. So they've been present for decades and there were attempts to exclude them um, in the 1960s and 70s, but that eventually stopped. And when it stopped, the marsh declined. There was a massive dis disappearance of most aquatic vegetation and a corresponding reduction to the use of the marsh by migrating waterfowl. In 2013, DUC and partners built exclusion structures between the marsh and the lake to keep out large body carp. And then we undertook a whole variety of research um, looking at monitoring of fish and water quality vegetation and duck responses. We found that exclusion structures were in fact successful in keeping out large numbers of, of spawning carp on the Delta Marsh. The graph on the left here shows catch per unit efforts both inside the exclusion area in red and outside the exclusion area, which is in blue, both pre and post constructions. You see there has been a decline in the number of large carp that are in the marsh. And there has been an associated response that even though large numbers, even though carp were not fully eradicated from the marsh, there was a response of the aquatic vegetation, the water quality improved, and migrating ducks came back. And that graph on the, on the right shows populations of birds predicted Ducks per, diving ducks per kilometer squared in um, the 60s through 80s when there was control and this gray shading. Um, then no control, decline, and then back to this immediate response in 2013 to 2017 of those diving ducks. So that's considered a great success. And there were six main funding partners for this project, but there was also individuals who donated. We received in-kind support from the USGS and Delta Waterfowl. And these pictures of these many people or there as a reminder that while it's collaboration and it's a partnership among organizations, it really requires dozens and dozens of people making on the ground contributions. So just it's both peoples and their organizations. The final example is the biological control of Phragmites in Ontario. Phragmites is considered one of the most problematic invasive species for aquatic systems in Canada. It chokes out marshes, reduces biodiversity, and just does bad stuff. And so Ducks Limited Canada is working with provincial organizations, federal academics, NGOs, a whole suite of folks to field test a novel biological control agent. Um, the research for this work began in 1998, so a lot of lab work uh, first to determine that there was going to be minimal or ideally no effects for native species. And eventually in 2019, the federal government gave us permission to do field testing. And the biological 
ecological control is considered a tool for management to restore biodiversity, improve wetland resilience to climate change and so on, but it's not, it's recognized that it's not a means of eradication, but meant to be used in conjunction with other management tools. So the biocontrol agent is, are, are two species of moss that came from Switzerland. Um, there was, again, there's an extensive work done in the lab about specificity for different plant species and so on. And it was determined that these species of moths were adapted to invasive Phragmites and would not impact native Phragmites species in part due to some morphological differences between those two that don't allow the moths to overwinter in native species of Phragmites, but on invasive species of Phragmites, they will lay eggs underneath the leaf sheaths, they will overwinter, those moths will hatch the larvae in the, in the springtime and they'll bur burrow into the, the stems and basically damage the plant by restricting its growth and its spread. So there's been approximately 24,000 insects have been released across 30 sites in Ontario. Damage has been observed. So it's the insects are successfully reproducing and overwintering. They plan to have eight to 12 new sites in 2024. And there'll also be four nursery sites established across Ontario over the next three years. And those nursery sites are basically just places where they can become source populations where they can take those um, invasive moths and drop them into patches of, of different um, invasives. And so there's lots more research to be done here. There's work on developing new monitoring techniques using drones to characterize communities, you know, monitor success and so on. Um, this shot shows the primary funding partners and they range from international to national to provincial to regional to NGOs and so on. But the main point here is that to be successful, you know, the common thread amongst these programs is that they built a team and support for control based upon why it was important and the benefits to society that are likely to come from it. More specifically, there was a very clear issue. Uh, there was lead agency or agencies that took the lead in rallying partners, including linking, you know, the problem to the mandates of those organizations to help them get on board, but also to help rally the troops and keep them motivated to help them pers persevere because this, you know, as we all know, this is a long game and there may be setbacks. And so you know, having a team that's resilient to those setbacks is pretty important. And they all kept in mind the three Ms, mobilize, monitor, and market. And the last one's important because I mean, you can have great success, but if nobody knows about it, the support for that can dwindle. And so the, the more people you have that are aware of the problem, that are, you know, recognize why it's important and then can contribute to support can help achieve success in the long game. So more help is better. That's all I have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I'll say I am hoping that the winds blow that Fragmites biocontrol over to New York. I would benefit. We do have time for a question. So how do you know the moths will only harm the invasives and won't yeah, that's a pretty important question, and I don't have the answer to. I I know that some of the lab work has done is is testing with different species of of native plants, um, and they weren't surviving on it. But the evolution through time of the biocontrol agent is, I think, that's a concern that we have any time these things are introduced, and and it's certainly something that they're monitoring. And I know that now that they're released, it's hard to call them back in, so to speak, but. There have been various levels of checks through different agencies within the, the provincial government, the federal government, and so on, that you know, it is deemed reasonably acceptable. I know that's not a satisfying answer, but that's kind of where things are at at the moment. No, we understand that biocontrols can be extremely complicated. There are some other questions in the question and answer. So if you have time, uh, we'd love for you to be able to go in and do that. But we got to move on to our next presentation. And the next one is me. Sorry, you have to deal with me and my colleague, Lynn Bogan. I, again, invasive species biologist for New York State Parks. Lynn is our assistant director of environmental stewardship. We're both out of the Albany office and our scopes are statewide. And we'll be providing you with a kind of like an, a million foot view of basically how we approach managing invasive species in a cl changing climate and how we try to turn doom and gloom into hope and opportunity. Take it away, Lynn. All right. Thanks, Matt. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. This is a really exciting opportunity for us at State Parks. Today, we're going to quickly run through what we have at risk in our state park system, outline our approach to invasives management, give you some example projects, and then go through some major lessons learned. 
All right. So here at OPRHP at New York State Parks, we're celebrating our centennial and we're proud to share all that are 180 parks and 35 historic sites throughout New York State have to offer. Thank you. <laughs> um, proud to share that with you and with the 79 million visitors who uh, visited our state parks last year alone. Um, as you can see, State Parks has a lot to offer for recreational and edu educational opportunities statewide. Uh, in addition to providing those recreational and educational opportunities, the 350,000 acres that we steward um, are 90% natural and are home to over 180 species of rare animals, over 240 species of rare plants, 140 miles of Great Lakes and St. Lawrence River shoreline, 140, 183 miles of shoreline along the ocean and Hudson River, we're home to 100 natural communities of statewide significance. So we have a lot to steward under our purview. These are very special and unique places that have become state parks and historic sites for a reason, for good reason. And our mission is to provide safe and enjoyable recreation and um, interpretive opportunities for people and to be good stewards of our natural, cultural, and historic assets. Our statewide environmental stewardship priorities guide our work. We like to say in state parks that we're all stewards, all staff are stewards, whether that be dedicated environmental stewardship staff or other staff running the agency and running the parks and facilities. Collectively, all these ama amazing staff work together to maintain healthy, resilient natural communities and native biodiversity, protect and conserve rare, threatened and endangered species, provide habitat connectivity and wildlife corridors in parks and across the landscape, provide sustainable use of these natural areas, which is a hard balance with 79 million people, provide recreational and an educational opportunities and enhance our understanding of these natural assets under our care. That said, the challenges that we face are many and far reaching, as I'm sure you all well know. These are threats to the ecological and public health under our care, and they are in both independent and confounding variables together. Uh, you saw lots of news articles earlier. Our work's not getting any easier. It's getting harder. I'm sure you well know that. This is just some illustrative examples in the news of the challenges that we all face. So this is where I'm going to try to race through the rest of the presentation because uh, we're here to try to figure out how can we successfully manage invasive species, which is this horrible working environment that climate change is providing us. And for us, it's really in the approach. Like we really try to start thinking about a project. We try to establish a reasonable purpose. We plan holistically. We prioritize our actions and resources, and we try to manage adaptively. We often recognize that we can never do everything. So we really want to make sure that we can do the best we can with what we have. It's really easy for us in general to get stuck with creating lofty ide idealistic goals, but they can often lead to being overwhelmed, like us feeling overwhelmed and often impossible to meet. This is like a really oversimplified view of invasive species management in state park. Essentially, our mission informs our priorities for stewardship. The invasive species unit takes those priority and translates them in ways for uh, establishing priorities that will make sure those stewardship priorities are met. And then our regions evaluate, establish targets, prioritize, and then implement projects. And the nice thing about this is it all reflects back onto each other. So if projects are succeeding or failing for some reason, it informs the regions, the unit, and the division on how we may want to adjust our priorities. And we do this through... Planning holistically, plan. RAD is just one example and it works for us. So it helps us make more informed, purposeful and strategic decisions because let's be honest, our work is complicated and it's a pain in the butt. And honestly, these are complex systems and they aren't isolated. We have to consider climate change projection, deer impacts, visitor safety, water quality impacts, rare species impacts and more. And not understanding the complexities behind your project will set you up for failure. 
So want to run through some example projects to kind of portray this a little better. A big thing for us is conservation targets and rare species protection. This is easy when you know when you're succeeding because, hey, the species is there. Success. The American heart tongue fern is under pressure, especially from swallowwort, and we'll never errat eradicate the pale swallowwort within that park. But we are dedicating ourselves to protecting that species. So we know that we will have to consistently remove pale swallowwort, and that's okay. Our goal is not to eradicate swallowwort. Our goal is to protect the heart tongue fern. That's really important because it leads to prioritization. So this is a really complex example. Prioritization doesn't have to be this complex. We have a lot of hemlocks in our parks. They're extremely important. Often they make the park what it is. And as you know, hemlocks aren't having a grand old time with HWA right now. So when resources are tight, how can we target what is absolutely the most important? So we worked with the Hemlock Initiative in New York DEC to help us create this matrix to help us think through those hard questions. Knowing what you're targeting is important because it helps soften the gloom because you know you're doing the best that you can. So prioritize, like I said, doesn't need to be this complicated. You could simply say, I'm going to focus on knotweed because that's more impactful and I'm not going to focus on knapweed. This is important because a lot of these projects take time and dedication and commitment. And this, like, don't go into something if you don't think you can do it correctly. We need to recognize that these projects sometimes can take decades. We've been working at Iona Marsh for almost 20 years now, and uh, you might not see success right away. This is the long-term gain. This is a very important piece of land to help mitigate climate change impacts in the area. And essentially what we're striving to do is restore ecosystem function and resiliency. So when we do this, when we restore the function and the resiliency and connectivity, these systems are more resilient in the long run. And this is scalable. Maybe you need to replace a culvert with something that allows proper connectivity to help with your Phragmites project. If you don't, you might be treating Phragmites for the rest of your life. So understanding this function and resiliency is important because it leads to disaster if you can't identify it. And this is happening right now. We've lost almost three to 40,000 trees in about two years on the South Fork of Long Island. This was an overstocked pitch pine forest. And, you know, this is a huge impact. This is scary. And after looking at sea level rise and community protections and climate change, we believe that it might be worth investing in storing this community, but to a more resilient self. So this is Forrester Rob. He's standing next to a, a nice managed system that they just did in Sarnoff Preserve. And this is what a healthy pitch pine system might look like. This is Nappy prior to the um, SPB. And you can see how overstocked. And at, this is perfect breeding ground for a Southern pine beetle and they just spread through and caused havoc. So this is an opportunity for us to create a more healthy and resilient ecosystem through restoration. But Matt, I know you're only one person. How are you supposed to know how to do all of this? This is just some of the partners that we work with across the country and into Canada and so on. You're not alone. And a great way to get involved is risk. I got widely involved with risk about a year ago. And, you know, it's, it's kind of awesome because all I can say is if you're a manager and you aren't interacting with your risk in some shape and form, get on it. It's full of people who want to work with you. And then last but not least, we're not going to have questions for us. So I apologize, but I want to focus 30 seconds on this. Success, success is not measured or success is measured in decade, not days. These things take time. If you're coming against barriers, it's okay. Your path is winding and wild, and you will get there. Just keep pushing through. Understand that these things take time and adjust what you need to do over time. Disaster does still bring opportunity. You might have a huge impact, but think of it as a clean slate, and you can build something that's better. And then most importantly, a small success can just be as important as a big success. The smallest deed 
is better than the greatest intention. If you sit there and think about what you could do but never act, you essentially have already lost. And lastly, I want to bring this to everyone that this is the story of our changing planet and what we can do together to help it thrive. And I don't think anybody has said that better than Sir David Attenborough himself. So we do not have time for questions because I talk too much. And we are going to move on to the next presentation. Thanks, Lynn. All right, our next one is Jessica Spencer. So Jessica Spencer is here with us from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers down in Jacksonville. I just vacationed in Jacksonville. And she will be talking us through salt cedar eradication in Florida and the increased urgency due to climate change. Take it away. All right. I'm actually down at the St. Augustine alligator farm today, and uh, I do not have full control of my surroundings. So if you hear some children screaming, not mine. I am Jessica Spencer. Like you said, I'm going to talk about our efforts to eradicate salt cedar here in Florida and why there's an increased urgency due to climate change. So just to get us started, salt cedar is uh, what we're up against. This is an invasive woody shrub or small tree. It is very well adapted to both flood and drought conditions. So um, it can actually survive being inundated for several months at a time, as long as part of it's out of the water. It reproduces vegetatively as well as by seed. Those seeds are wind and water dispersed. It is a prolific seed producer. Each plant can produce a million seeds per year. And here in Florida, they can produce flowers within five months of germination. So the, there's a really quick turnaround time for them to become reproductive. And this plant changes the soil chemistry by increasing the salinity at the soil surface. So it can actually alter habitats and make it less you know, suitable for native vegetation. Its habitat requirements, it's pretty versatile. It does need full sun to get established, but um, as long as it's got moist soils for two to four weeks after germination, it'll send down a taproot and um, be able to survive drought conditions. Um, similar species grow in the Mojave Desert, so obviously it can tolerate um, very long periods without rainfall. Um, it can grow in pretty much any type of soil, and it does love to take advantage of disturbance. So here in Florida, we recognized in 2008 that salt cedar had established on some of our core dredge material management areas, or DMMAs, and this was likely due to contaminated equipment from some of the DMMAs up in Georgia. Georgia has an abundance of salt cedar, and it proliferates on our dredge material sites up there, so it is very likely that it could have been transferred um, on that equipment. Um, in 2010, we did some additional surveys and discovered that we had salt cedar populations at at least 10 of our different DMMAs throughout Northeast Florida. And so this map shows some of those sites. So this is the greater Jacksonville area with the St. Johns River coming out right there. And all along the St. Johns River, you can see those various colors. Those are different disposal sites that had it. And then the intracoastal waterway runs north-south along the coast. And you can see up at the top, there's a couple um, of sites there. There's also one along the St. Johns River. So again, it's likely that there was um, equipment that was transferred between these sites, but we had it all the way down into um, northern St. Johns County. Um, in addition to those sites, we also had what I call our escapees. So these were salt cedars that were not established on the dredge material sites, but had kind of jumped the boundary and gotten into um, more sort of natural areas, but they still had some degree of disturbance, roadsides, um, retention ponds. But up in that Northern section of the map, you'll see there's one um, up at the very top of the screen. That one had gotten established on a beach um, in one of our state parks. So again, a natural disturbance, but a disturbance nonetheless that it was to able to take advantage of. So with climate change, we're expecting to see more and more of those natural 
sort of climate driven um, disturbances. So that was something that was definitely a concern. So in 2010, we had these super dense monocultures. You can see the picture there. Um, we were able to treat those with contractors and get the majority of those sites under control and into a more maintenance level um, of control. Since then, from 2011 to 2024, I have been out monitoring and have killed over 4,400 salt cedar plants scattered throughout that same region along the St. John's River. So again, it does take determination and um, a certain amount of persistence, but um, we are really close to being able to declare success on this. Unfortunately, we do have to deal with climate impacts. So here in Florida, um, you know, one of the most glaring climate impacts is our abundance and severity of hurricanes and tropical systems moving into the state. So just this year, we had record high temperatures down in the Keys. The water temperature itself was over 100 degrees. So that has been able to fuel these rapidly intensifying hurricanes um, that reach, you know, category four and five status almost overnight. Those intense winds can create quite a deal of uh, a storm surge. And we've been dealing with that quite a bit. The stars that you see represent that general location of where we're doing the salt cedar control efforts. So here in the Northern Hemisphere, where our cyclones uh, spin counterclockwise, you can see that would increase, you know, that onshore flow. And it really um, gets a lot of that salt water well up into the St. John's River. Um, so it, it has some pretty significant impacts. As I said, this is a picture along the St. John's River by some of those dredge material sites where we have salt cedar. And you can see along that fringe of the marsh, there's, you know, all that gray material, which is shrubs and trees that have died back due to that saltwater inundation from the storm surge flooding. So we are seeing those impacts. That is the exact habitat that salt cedar would love to take advantage of. So basically, we got lucky. We were able to get in and eliminate a lot of those dense populations of salt cedar that were producing millions of seeds every year prior to a lot of these intensive impacts that we've seen with hurricanes Matthew, Irma, Ian, Nicole, an assortment of others. But, you know, had we not been able to get that population under control, it is very likely that it would have been able to take advantage of those disturbances. Lucky for us, we also have the fact that salt cedar has a relatively short-lived seed viability. So the seeds are only viable for less than a year. So again, we're lucky that we're not dealing with something that has a much longer viability. But my take-home message is think about which habitats on your managed lands are vulnerable to climate change disturbances. Consider increased monitoring of areas that might have natural or climate enhanced disturbances so that you can track those changes and see if there's anything that is taking advantage of that condition and prioritize management of invasive species that are well suited to take advantage of those disturbances in those particular habitats. So that's my recommendation and my short story. And with that, um, I don't think I have time for questions, but if you want to reach out to me, I've got my contact information there and would be happy to talk to you in more detail. We've got time. Uh, so we can take one question. Where is salt cedar native to? Are there any native enemies? I think it's kind of playing on the idea of the biocontrol. Yeah before. Yeah, so there there was a biocontrol. It's native kind of to the Mediterranean region. So there's several different species that have been introduced to the U.S. They're, you know, pretty much all invasive. We don't have a native one here. They do hybridize very readily. So that's another complication. I know out west, they had the Diarabda beetle that was released, but then there was a lawsuit because of the southwestern willow flycatcher, an endangered bird that once the willows were replaced by salt cedar, it started nesting in salt cedar. And so then they didn't want the salt cedars removed because it was nesting habitat for the rare bird. So it's a very complicated mess. But because of that, the biocontrol program was shut down. 
So unfortunately, we don't have an active biocontrol for salt cedar at this point. But um, here in Florida, there's such a limited amount of it that um, we are working for full eradication. And like I said, we're really close. Um, I just found two this past site visit that I did. And both of those were, you know, germinated within the past year. So, you know, I feel pretty good about the progress that we've made so far. It has been a long road to get here, but we are really close. Awesome. Thank you so much. There are some other questions in the question and answer. So if you wouldn't mind hanging around and trying to answer some of those, that would be wonderful. We're going to move on to our next presenter. We're going to fly from Florida to Hawaii and hear from Molly Murphy. She is the Invasive Plant Prevention Coordinator at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She will be talking with us about early detection in real time using iNaturalist. So Molly, feel free to share your screen and take it away. Thank you for inviting me to speak at this inaugural conference. Um, before I get started, I want to give a huge mahalo to Kevin Facenda, whose innovations made all of this work possible. Okay. Did you know that there are no laws regarding the sale and importation and cultivation of invasive species here in Hawaii? It is legal to import more than 99% of the world's flowering plants, no questions asked. Well, what about that 1%? It's actually about 0.3% and that is the noxious weed rules which allows the Department of Agriculture the authority to regulate the trade of these plants. It is a list of about 100 species, and it was created in 1993. Since then, I have become a mother and a grandmother. So we're talking generations of time without updating the list. It's not keeping up with the times and trends of the plant trade. This is the invasion curve, which everybody's more than familiar with. As time goes on, it becomes more costly and difficult to manage invasive species. So I work for the Big Island Invasive Species Committee, and we work on all phases of the invasion curve. But we have no authority to regulate the trade, so our prevention program is a voluntary program. But our plant crew, they work on eradication and containment of invasive species. We are forced to be reactive and not proactive. So we need to learn how to be reactive as quickly and efficiently as possible. And the first step is finding and documenting newly naturalized plants. So the old way of doing it is we would drive our cars at five miles an hour, craning our heads out the window, looking for out of place plants that have escaped cultivation and are reproducing on their own without human help. You need to be hyper vigilant when you do this type of survey. Um, it took us five years to do the entire island, and that was with two to four full-time staff. During that time, we averaged eight naturalization records a year. And of course, you can't see in people's backyards. It's only what you can see um, from the roadside. One time we were doing this survey and we got to the end of the road. And so we turned around in a residence driveway and we pulled up just far enough to see a pampas grass population in this person's yard. At the time, pampas grass was an eradication target for us at BISC. And I'm very proud to say that we did eradicate it off the entire island of Hawaii. So this type of um, survey, it's very, very costly, but there is a plus. You can document a large list of plants while you're doing the survey. Funding is thin when it comes to invasive species, so we need to do better with what resources are available. Okay, here's our new way, using citizen science plant ID apps for early detection. Since enacting this method, we have averaged 18 records a year. 
There is a caveat. It depends on people uploading pictures with accurate locations and new species need to be identified and looked at by humans. Promelena odorata is a noxious weed in Hawaii. It was uploaded to iNaturalist three years before we found it growing near the Hilo drag strip. So the key to prevention is awareness. <clears throat> but we've learned to implement this new method. So we're finding our plants faster and quicker and more efficiently. Okay, here's how it works. On the left, we have the Hawaii Vascular uh, Plants Checklist. And this is a list of thousands of plants that have been documented as naturalized. And they're all separated by island. In the middle, we have Hawaii Island with every single plant point that's ever been uploaded to iNaturalist. So we put them together and we filtered it out. And our output is a list of plants that are possibly naturalized on the island. So we can drive right up to them and possibly get four naturalization records in a day. Of course, we still have to ground truth. We'll go there and we'll document accordingly. I would say about 85% of the time, we do get a naturalization record. Sometimes it's a misidentified plant or sometimes it's obviously cultivated. So why I naturalist? I know because Kevin Pacenda and I tested it. Most plant ID apps have a Northern Hemisphere bias. So we wanted to make sure iNaturalist was best for us. Okay. Myconia calvescens is also a noxious weed in Hawaii. You can see this green icon right here. That represents a myconia creeping out of the core population. All of these red icons right here are, that is the core. That's our containment area for myconia. This is at 2,800 feet, which is the highest recorded elevation that we know of myconia. So whether it's change in climate or other factors, this small population is outside of the containment area. Don't worry, our crew pulled out those juveniles before they reached reproductive maturity and spread. So with changing climate, plants are shifting ranges into new areas. It might not be new plants to Hawaii, but new to areas that were previously uninhabitable. We strive to keep our containment species within their zones. We can't be everywhere all at once. It took us five years to make one path on the road. So iNaturalist allows us to have our eyes on the ground, reporting new naturalization records and reporting new species shifting ranges. Thank you. Thank you. So got a time for a quick question. Are you using iNaturalist to find aquatic invasives too? No, not me, but uh, I think Kevin Facenda probably is. He uses it for a lot of different records, but it's definitely possible. And we have one more. Do you have issues in Hawaii with permission for control? In Massachusetts, we are often stymied by the long time it takes to get permission to remove something, especially if it's in a wetland area. Yes, we do. Um, we have no authority to enter properties, so we kind of have to sweet talk people. And sometimes it takes years. Um, people have sold their homes and we've waited years to get permission from the realtor. Other people passed away. Usually we try to give them something in trade. So if they have one of our invasive target species, we'll give them a non-invasive plant that looks similar to replace it. Wonderful. There are more questions in the question and answer. If you have time, can you please stay and try to answer some of those and we'll move on to our last one. Our last one is going to be a treat, spotted lanternfly. Jessica LaBelle is a program specialist with the Washington Invasive Species Council. She is here and will be able to answer questions in the question and answer, so please put them in but we're going to play her rec previously recorded video and it's on the banding together to create the Washington State Spotted Lanternfly Action Plan. Hello everyone, and thank you for this opportunity to present at this conference. This is very exciting. 
My name is Jessica LaBelle, and I am the Invasive Species Program Specialist for the Washington Invasive Species Council. I'm here to talk to you today about the spotted lanternfly, its biology, and the threat its establishment would pose to our way of life here in Washington, and our plans to prepare for it, notably the development of the Washington State Spotted Lanternfly Action Plan. Spotted lanternfly, or Lycorma delicatula, is an insect in the plant hopper family, and it has what are called piercing sucking mouth parts. And you can see that outlined on the right. It looks pretty impressive. They thankfully don't pierce or suck people. They are harmless to handle, but they are a massive threat to a variety of plants and feed on over 170 known species, with even more being added as they expand into new areas. So they're native to China, Bangladesh, and Vietnam and have been introduced and are considered invasive in South Korea, Japan, and the United States. So they're not currently found in Washington state, but we are preparing for them. And I'll get into the how and why of that later. Um, also of note about these little guys is that they have a unique relationship with tree of heaven, which is a widespread invasive species itself and the tree in the background of this picture. Um, they're heavily drawn to it. Research has shown that spotted lanternflies that are exposed to Tree of Heaven during their life cycle are hardier and have better reproductive fitness. So they don't need Tree of Heaven in order to establish in an area, but their relationship with it is so close that most managing agencies target Tree of Heaven and spotted lanternfly simultaneously. In Washington State, Tree of Heaven is classified as a Class C weed meaning it's either widespread or of agricultural concern, or in this case, both. So the reason why spotted lanternfly is such an issue is because of how it feeds. It uses that piercing sucking mouth part to puncture the stem or the trunk of a plant, and it drinks the phloem or the sugary sap. This weakens the plant, but the spotted lanternfly also continually excretes as it feeds and their excrement is a sugary, sticky substance called honeydew. And you can see that in the photo on the left. Honeydew promotes the growth of sooty mold, which you can see in the middle photo. And sooty mold decreases the plant's ability to photosynthesize. It attracts other insects, and it leaves the plant susceptible to more diseases. So the weakened plant often dies. In addition, they like to swarm feed which you can see in the photo on the right. So it multiplies the problem pretty quickly. The initial detection of spotted lanternfly was in Pennsylvania in 2014, and it's now in some 15 states. You can see the spread here. So this all came from one introduction of a spotted lanternfly, which is believed to have been in a shipment of stone coming from Asia. So in that previous image, we saw how quickly this insect spread to new areas in under 10 years. A habitat suitability study was conducted to pinpoint areas of the United States that would be particularly susceptible to spotted lanternfly. And you can see that image here. So red is highly suitable for spotted lanternfly and white is unsuitable. So that's a pretty large chunk of the country and includes many of our major cities and agricultural areas. So I have a list here on the right of just some of the plants that would be at risk of predation by spotted lanternfly, including grapes, hops, cherries and other stone fruit, pine and other conifers, hardwoods, and culturally significant ethnobotanicals. So that's quite a problem given the areas in this image. That same study also focused on Washington State, and you can see that the densely populated I-5 corridor in Western Washington and our agricultural breadbasket uh, in Eastern Washington are both at risk. These numbers are from 2021, but show that Washington is a top producer of a variety of commodities that could be heavily impacted by spotted lanternfly. Uh, Washington produces over $2 billion in apples, 482 million in hops, 476 million in cherries, 300 million in grapes, and 228 million in blueberries each year. 
Washington also produces over $3 billion annually in timber and accounts for 25% of U.S. log and lumber product exports and 9% of U.S. paper products. So also at risk are resources that we really can't put a dollar value on, like our environment, cultural resources, and the trees and plants in our urban and suburban landscapes. So the good news is that we are prepared. Uh, the Washington Invasive Species Council received a $90,000 grant from the United States Department of Agriculture, Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, Plant Protection and Quarantine in 2022 uh, to prepare for the arrival of spotted lanternfly as best we can. And to do that, we formed the Spotted Lanternfly Preparedness Advisory Group to develop a state action plan. I'm proud to have been the facilitator of this group, and it's really unique because instead of just one agency, like the State Department of Agriculture writing the action plan, we had input from all the state and federal agencies that could be impacted by spotted lanternfly, a variety of industry representatives, and tribal nations. In addition to the state action plan, which I will talk more about shortly, we contracted to develop different support tools like GIS maps and forms, outreach materials, and held workshops to increase public and industry awareness. So you can find the Washington State Spotted Lantern Fly Action Plan by going to the Washington State Department of Agriculture website at agr.wa.gov and searching for Spotted Lantern Fly or by going to the Washington Invasive Species Council website at invasivespecies.wa.gov. So I don't have time to cover all the different portions of the plan today, but there is one section that I would like to highlight, which is the inclusion of cultural impacts. And that's a topic that has unfortunately been overlooked in previous action plans for plant health emergencies. In previous pest responses, tribal nations and indigenous communities have been notified if there was eradication or rapid response work being conducted within a certain distance of reservation land. However, it's important to note that our indigenous peoples have interests that are not restricted to reservation lands. They might have culturally significant sites or traditional harvest areas for different plants and animals off the reservation. We consulted with the cultural resources staff at the Washington State Recreation and Conservation Office and obtained a list of tribal nations and indigenous communities to notify when conducting work in each county and included this in the state action plan. So this preserves the privacy of culturally sensitive locations while keeping the lines of communication open. We also wanted to identify which culturally important plants could be at risk to spotted lanternflies so we could target communications to tribal nations and indigenous communities. What we learned is that there are more species at risk than just first foods. There are a number of culturally significant ethnobotanicals or plants that are important for traditional medicines, shelter, cooking, ceremonies, clothing, baskets, all different kinds of things. And it's really important to identify those. So this presented a challenge because if you learn about the history of the United States, including very recent history, uh, traditional knowledge keepers have very good reasons for not sharing information on what's important to them with the state or federal government. So to be sensitive to that, we conducted an extensive literature review to find species of culturally significant ethnobotanicals that are already known. This is a list of the culturally significant ethnobotanicals that would be at risk if spotted lanternfly were to become established in Washington state and which is included in the state action plan. You'll see that some specific species are listed, but more often the genus uh, is listed. So remember that the spotted lanternfly has not yet made it to Washington. So this is not an exhaustive list, only a list of what they're currently known to feed on. That's it for me. This is my contact information. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions you may have. Visit the Washington Invasive Species Council website at invasivespecies.wa.gov. And if you're in Washington State, please download our free reporting app for smartphones, Washington Invasives. Thank you. Okay, um, so I believe we're Moving into break, we don't have time to do any live questions because we went over a little bit, but please feel free to continue to put your questions in the Q&A and I'll pass it over to Elliot. 
Okay, I want to thank Matt as moderator and all of the session presenters in our last session. We are on break. It's going to be a break about eight minutes. So we will reconvene at 2.05 Eastern. And meanwhile, if you're looking for something to do, I wanted to put up the QR code for our mentee poll. So if you have not yet filled that out, you can access that with the QR code. Please let us know where you're from. And we've got a few questions about uh, who you are and what you do. So please let us know. In addition to that, we have a survey that we would love for you to fill out. This is our post-ISC conference survey. The QR code is here. This will really help us to evaluate how well we did, what we can improve for the future. And I'm just going to put the break slide up. And, and again, my name is Elliot Parsons. I'm from the Pacific Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Network, Pacific Risk. Uh, one of the conference organizers, and I'll be moderating our next session in just a few minutes. So um, see you at five minutes after the hour. Welcome back to the next session for uh, the ISC. Uh, I am the moderator. My name is Elliot Parsons. I'm a specialist with the Pacific Regional uh, Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Network. And I've got a couple of quick things for our session, which is lessons learned from island ecosystems. We'll be starting off with Dr. Aaron Shields from USDA National Wildlife Research Center, moving to uh, Glenn Dulia, uh, assistant professor, University of Guam. Uh, I'll be presenting after that. And then David Will from Island Conservation will be the next presenter, followed by Patty Bio. Uh, and then we'll be uh, closing that off uh, around 325 Eastern. A couple quick things about island conservation. As many of you know, uh, islands are highly vulnerable to both invasive species and climate change. We'll be hearing about that vulnerability today. Many islands are isolated. They are small. They have low population sizes of a high proportion of endemic species. Um, and a lot of islands are also in regions such as the Pacific region that are highly vulnerable to climate change, including sea level rise, where the intersections of invasive species and climate change are really important for maintaining ways of life that we'll learn about today. We've got some interesting research to share, some uh, regional perspectives to share. Uh, I'll talk about the, the Pacific Risk Network. And, and then we've got some great success stories through island conservation to finish with at the end. And the, the main purpose of the session is to showcase islands as places of both vulnerability, but also places where we can share those successful management strategies and success stories Islands are also heavily invaded, as we'll find out. Uh, on some islands, for example, the number of non-native plants outnumber the number of native plants. And so there's a lot that can be learned from islands that have been transformed for many decades to hundreds of years. Those lessons learned can be translated to continental audiences. And so with that, I am going to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Aaron Shields uh, is project leader, a research scientist at the USDA National Wildlife Research Center in Fort Collins, Colorado. And his talk today is Invasive Rodent Responses to Increased Hurricane Frequency. Aaron, please take it away whenever you're ready. All right. Well, thanks, Elliot, for the introduction. And wow, what a great conference and great talk so far. So thanks for um, inviting me. What I have for you today is an opportunity to share some of my research, and this is the topic, of course, invasive rodents on islands, and these are the two main questions that I'm covering. One is, how do hurricanes influence invasive rodent populations and their behaviors? And the related question, are there changes expected in the future, um, given our knowledge of increased hurricane frequency? Just a little bit of background about Invasive rodents, the ones that I'm going to be speaking about today, um, are shown in the picture here. There's these four species, three rats and the house mouse. 
Um, so over 80% of the world's island groups in all continents except Antarctica have one or more of these invasive rodent species. Um, they cause massive damage. In the U.S. alone, over $20 billion in, in damage each year, and that's a figure that's over 20 years old. And then for all of us interested in native species conservation, these are probably the animals responsible, the invasive animals responsible for the greatest number of plant and animal extinctions on islands. Why are they so successful? Well, they're highly commensal, which means they can live very closely and well with humans but they're also very opportunistic. They can live in very isolated places where humans are not, occupy a lot of habitats, including hot, wet, cold, and dry. Like many invasives and many rodent species in general, they're highly fecund. They have these large incisor teeth that you see in the upper picture there. And those teeth are built to chew and gnaw into very hard food items like seeds and destroy them. And then for those of us that also, like those animals that live in canopies, these are at risk also to these invasive rodent species, given that they climb very well and they can forage on the ground as well as in the canopy. So that's a little bit about the rodents. What about hurricanes? So hurricanes, typhoons, cyclones, they're all synonyms for these large windstorm events. They occur in very set places across the planet. As you can see here, the place that I'm going to talk to you about today is the Caribbean. Um, particularly the yellow dot there. What you need to know is that hurricane frequency is on the rise. Some feel that it's due to a natural uptick in a long-term cycle, natural cycle, but most others are finding and modeling has shown that much of that increase in hurricane frequency is due to human-induced global climate change. So like I said, I'm going to be talking about a few of these islands in the Caribbean where we've been doing some research particularly jumping down to the bottom there, three U.S. Virgin Islands, and those three are shown in the, the box in the middle there, and the island of Puerto Rico. And the two research questions that I'm asking or that I'm covering are, is there evidence that new islands become invaded following hurricanes? And secondly, how do invasive mammal populations change after hurricanes? I'm focusing, of course, on invasive rodents. I realize that this map shows the pink which are mongoose that were brought in to control invasive rodents back in the 1800s. There'll be a little bit on mongoose, but mostly on rodents. So that first question, is there evidence that new islands become invaded following hurricanes? The quick answer is yes. Um, there's a small offshore island off the main island of St. Croix that we studied. It's called Green Cay. It's about 450 meters off of the shore of, Green, of St. St. Croix. Um, we measured um, looking for detection for invasive rodents before and after um, these two category three to five hurricanes that passed over in September of 2017. That was Irma and Maria. The way that we do these measurements, and you can see those yellow dots um, across the small island where we place these tracking tunnels. These are plastic tunnels that have baited ink cards in them so that small mammal is drawn into the bait, it gets ink on its paws or hands, and then it walks out and we can identify the tracks, the foot tracks to genus. So before the hurricane, there were no rats on the island and they had been taken off to protect the endangered lizard there, the amoeba polyps. And after hurricane, we did uh, document rats. We think that they got there probably by debris being blown off from the main island of St. Croix and the rats rafting to the nearby island. And they're also very good swimmers, so that could be a way as well. So once we found this, that rats had indeed invaded after the hurricane, this island, we contacted the land uh, managers, which was U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and they contracted our USDA operations folks to uh, eradicate the rats on the island. Second question, how do these invasive mammals respond to hurricanes? So this is the southwest part of St. Croix, Sandy Point National Wildlife Refuge. Again, using tracking tunnels, all those yellow dots are our tracking tunnels that we deployed before. 
and after the hurricane to examine the relative abundance changes of the small mammal community. And so shown on the graph there, you can see the red bars are the post-hurricane surveys, and you can see particularly for the house mouse, they increased in abundance two and a half times that prior to the hurricanes. Now, the rats and mongoose had a, a tendency to decline after the hurricane in population, but I think it was only significant for the mongoose. And then cats are just not an animal because of their size and the tracking tunnel sizes. They don't lend themselves to these surveys, but feral cats were also um, in this area and detected before the hurricane, at least. I, I, you can see, I didn't mention it, but this area is important for native species conservation because it's among the highest sea turtle nesting areas in the region. So the third island in the U.S. Virgin Islands is uh, Buck Island. This is uh, managed by the National Park Service, and they um, eradicated rats in 2000, again, to protect these endangered species, the uh, amoebas and um, great uh, sea turtle nesting areas, as you can see by those beautiful white sand beaches. So it's been over 20 years since the rats have been eradicated. It wasn't known at the time, but um, that released house mice. And there's some information about house mice over on the far right there that says that really they're not a big threat to these native vertebrates that are the conservation species. But every year, the National Park Service does a survey on those five transects um, shown in yellow um, using snap traps to um, ensure that rats haven't gotten back onto Buck Island. Um, and so they also catch mice during that time. And you can see we use that information to understand better the effects of Hurricane Irma and Maria. And you can see that the mouse population doubled. Not only that after the hurricane, but that was associated with an increase in the grassy understory. And that's going to be important here in just a moment. So the last island that I'm going to take you to in the Caribbean is Puerto Rico. On this island in the northeast corner is the El Junque National Forest. It's also one of these 28 LTER, long-term ecological research sites. This particular site, the Luquillo site, focuses on disturbance. And you can imagine being in the Caribbean, hurricanes are a big part of that research line. So here's what the forest looked like the tropical rainforest looked like after Hurricane Maria in 2017. So one way to measure the effects of invasive rodents following hurricanes is to get lucky like we did in the Virgin Islands and have a survey and a hurricane comes along and goes across your study plot. The other way that we can do this and the way that I prefer, and that what we've done in Puerto Rico is to actually do an experiment. So what we did is we hired professional arborists to trim the canopy of the rainforest to simulate a hurricane. And you can drop down to the black box at the bottom there, and you can see we've done this twice already. In 2004, we did it. And then in 2014, we did it to see the repeated effects of hurricane uh, impacts on this forest without having to wait around for a hurricane. So this is what the forest looked like in these 30 by 30 meter plots after our, the arborist trimmed them. So back to the question of how do these invasive uh, rodents respond to severe hurricanes? Well, same type of uh, technique here using the tracking tunnels before and after the hurricane. You can see relative abundance um, on the uh, y-axis there. And before the hurricane, there were a lot of rats. Almost 80% of all the tracking tunnels we set out had rat detections. And then after the hurricane, still had a lot of rats, but not as many slightly a, a tendency to drop a little bit. But the big news was that we detected house mice for the first time in the interior of this rainforest. We knew that there had been house mice out near the roadside where there's grass cover, but it had never been detected in the interior of the forest. So what we think happened is that the canopy got opened up by this natural hurricane. It increases light, stimulates the understory grass growth, and it connects the roads to the interior of the forest. Species like the house mice that really like grassy areas then migrate in. We don't know how long they're, they're going to last there, but it's been four years already that they have persisted. What I didn't show you on this graph is anything for the simulated hurricane work with the arborists. The plots are just too small to do the population level work, but 
where we did see a pretty significant effect is in seed foraging. <clears throat> so we had set out seeds of native trees in the simulated hurricane plots and the controls, the ones that we didn't have, the arborist trim, um, before and after Hurricane Maria and Irma. And so those data are shown here. The number of seeds removed by vertebrates, it was almost all uh, rats, uh, invasive rats, um, were quite high before the hurricane relative to after the hurricane. But the most interesting finding was um, the difference in, in 2018 uh, post-hurricane, the difference between the two different types of treatment plots. So where the arborists had four years before trimmed the canopy, four years later the hurricane comes along, it was those plots that had the highest seed removal by invasive rats relative to the ones that had not been trimmed. And again, the understory had developed more. There was likely more food sources in those patches of previously disturbed forests. So part of my job is to manage invasive rodents and come up with new techniques and strategies of how to do that um, from a scientific point of view. So this is one of the areas when we implement rat management, we would go to these patches of high cover following hurricanes to protect those native species within those areas. So conclusions for the talk. First, invasive rodents will persist through pretty much everything, like we know. It doesn't matter about climate change, they're going to be around in all these environments. The interesting thing is, are they going to expand? And the answer in some cases is yes. We're likely to find them on new islands where they haven't been before. One of the management techniques here that could be implemented is um, doing surveys after these large storms in areas where you don't think you have rodents, invasive rodents. Secondly, um, there were species-specific responses to hurricanes. Invasive mice did consistently benefit from the hurricane effects. They increased in, in abundance greatly. They also ex expanded into the forest in the, in the rainforest of Puerto Rico. Like I said, the duration is not known. We've um, documented them in the understory of the rainforest for four years now. I'm due back for another trip. But again, it appears to be linked, correlated at least with grass cover. And lastly, um, after these hurricanes, invasive rats do forage in patches um, of these forests um, that have already been disturbed. And so, like I mentioned, you could target these areas to ma maximize control efforts. So um, with that, I'd just like to thank uh, funders and collaborators and co-authors. Um, and my contact information is at the bottom if, if uh, you'd like to get a hold of me. Thanks for your attention. Thanks so much, Dr. Shields. Uh, we do have time for a question, and it relates to interactions between rodents. So when you have multiple species of rodent on an island that are all non-native and, and you're you know, thinking about eradication, do you, do you have to take that into account, species interactions such as competition or direct interactions? Absolutely, yeah. There's a huge amount of research that goes into leading up to any kind of eradication of these invasive rodents or even the suppression of their populations. They're obviously a part of it, the ecosystem, even though they are not native, but we do risk assessments and measurements before, well before those um, management actions to get a better idea about those, better predictability about the effects and the risks. Great, well, thank you again, Dr. Shields. And we're gonna move on to our next talk in this session. I'd like to introduce Dr. Glenn Dulia. Uh, he is Assistant Professor, College of Natural and Applied Sciences, Plant Pathologist, Western Pacific Tropical Research Center at the University of Guam. He's also a, a core team member of the Pacific Risk, uh, and his presentation today will be Green Waste Management Plans, Climate Change, and Invasive Species in Guam. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Dulia, to take us away. Thank you, Elliot, and good morning, everyone. Thank you to the organizers for allowing me to speak um, on, I guess, a, a topic that uh, bothers me um, quite a bit, you know, being from Guam and experiencing and working with invasive species. My original title was Green Waste Management Plans. Um, but I took out the plans part because Guam doesn't have a green waste management plan. 
and throughout my talk, or at least at the end of my talk, I didn't want to, I guess, insinuate that we were actually trying to make a plan, uh, which is one of the things that I think about and bothers me as a natural resource manager. So during the break, I was trying to find Guam on Elliot's mentee poll, you know, to let everyone know where the conference attendees were from. I couldn't find Guam there. It was very tiny because Guam is a very small island in a small chain of islands in the Micronesian region. So in this small Micronesian island chain, Guam is the largest and most economically developed island in Micronesia. Because it is the largest island, we have the largest airport, largest commercial airport, and largest commercial seaport. And as you can see in this slide showing Matson, which is a shipping company, a sea shipping company, Guam is a regional hub for Micronesia. We take in cargo from all over the world, and that is concentrated on Guam and then redispersed to the rest of the Micronesian islands. Similarly, Guam is also, I guess, the air transport hub for the region. So we take in travelers, tourists, and air cargo, again, from all, ar all around the world, and then it's redispersed to the rest of the Micronesian region. Because of this influx and export of cargo and people, Guam plays a vital role in the region when it comes to biosecurity and to invasive species management. You know, we are home to 32 of the most invasive species in the world, and I'm sure that number uh, will eventually grow as globalization and the, our reliance on exports uh, increases. So of those 32 most invasive species in the world, the one I'll be focusing on today is the coconut rhinoceros beetle. Primarily it's because we do a bit of work and management on it, and we have a bit of data that would suggest best management practices or, I don't know, maybe just common sense practices. So the coconut rhinoceros beetle was discovered in Guam in 2007. And since then, it, it has overtaken the island despite uh, extensive quarantine and eradic eradication efforts. Now, uh, the coconut rhinoceros beetle, uh, as its name suggests, primarily uh, attacks uh, coconut palms. These are what our coconut trees look like on Guam again. And that's because the coconut rhinoceros beetle is specifically the adult life stage. The adults fly into the crowns, burrow, drill holes into the trees searching for sap to fuel its life cycle. And if it hits, you know, the apical meristem, eventually the, the tree will stop producing new fronds and then die. The adult life stage would be the most difficult part of the life stage to manage. So a lot of times we focus on trying to identify and eradicate and destroy breeding sites, which contain the, the larval life stages of the insect. And these breeding sites range anywhere from small cryptic sites within rotting coconut trees or other, uh, I guess, small or rotting organic spaces. Or on the other side of the spectrum, breeding sites can be as large as entire landfills of rotting vegetation. So this is just a picture of a hard fill site on the island that is used as a green waste dump site. And the accumulation of all this waste generates a large and massive coconut rhinoceros bearing site. If you look closely, you know, this was taken after the holidays. So you see a mixture of old Christmas trees. And then off to the right is a lot, mostly primarily coconut palms. So these green waste dumps are always present on the island. But what I wanted to talk about a little bit today, especially given that this is a, supposed to be linked to climate change, is the presence or the occurrence of typhoons and you know major storm events on the island that generate, I guess, periodic spikes in the green waste production of the island. So most recently, 
this came to light in a Category 4 typhoon that hit Guam in May of this year. So Typhoon Maywar was, I think, the first Category 4 typhoon that's rolled over Guam in the past two decades. It was 150 plus sustained winds and gusts to almost 200 miles per hour. So as Dr. Shields mentioned in the previous presentation, in the Pacific, there is an increasing trend of storm activity and storm magnitude. So this is a picture post-Typhoon Maywar, maybe a week or two afterwards, where a lot of green waste, several hundreds of thousands of tons of green waste was generated in the island in a single day. So the government of Guam was collecting up to 40,000 cubic yards of green waste every week at 19 different green waste satellite stations around the island. This one in particular, and which bothers me quite a bit, is this particular green waste dump site was right next to our seaport, which from a biosecurity perspective was very bothersome. Um, and, then, and additionally, on the left side is a picture of one of our technicians managing coconut rhinoceros beetle panel trap. And in the background, if you can look closely, there is a mountain of white goods and a mixture of green waste. And this is right next to <clears throat> our commercial airport. All right. So re recent research out of the University of Guam and the Guam Community College College did some mathematical modeling looking at the invasion and control of coconut rhinoceros beetle on Guam. And two of the major findings, at least relevant to my talk, is that they found that green waste removal is the most effective way to control the coconut rhinoceros beetle um, population. And that also typhoon events that generate these large amounts of green waste lead to rapid spikes in the coconut rhinoceros beetle population. And then this is my last slide. So within our research and management group, we do monitor populations around the ports of entry, specifically for biosecurity reasons. In this slide, it shows our populations around the ports of entry over the course of four years. And what you can see, there's a general trend, the dotted line, that we have increasing coconut rhinoceros beetle populations just over time. And if you look at year to year or periodically, there is this up and down pattern of populations throughout each individual year. Interestingly enough, you know, this recent study came out that modeled the population spikes after um, typhoons and then also showed that green waste removal is the most effective strategy. In 2020, Department of Interior funded us to remove um, all the breeding sites or as many as, as we could identify around the ports of entry. That's this little pink line off to the left. We re removed several dead coconut palms, which act as breeding sites, and 170 cubic yards of green waste. And that led to, a, I don't know if you can see my, uh, my cursor, but it led to a significant drop in the population that we believe would have originally uh, been, a, I guess, a large crest of CRB adults collected. And then throughout the years, as funding comes and goes, we've instituted new management practices that will hopefully, you know, be able to suppress these spikes in the CRB populations. Since this is at the ports of entry and it is, and it is a significant biosecurity risk, we hope to, you know, focus our limited efforts and our limited resources around these spikes of CRB to re reduce the potential of egress into the region. So we have a biological control that we've implemented and we started that in about 2023. And then most recently we have, you know, our storm event, Typhoon Maywar, uh, that generated all those cubic tons of green waste. And we're waiting for uh, a giant spike in the population. And hopefully our management strategies can reduce that incoming um, spike to the population. And to add to that, we have tree injections that will possibly manage that population. And 
yeah, I guess I'm a little bit over. I'll just end it there. Thank you, everyone. And then if we, there's time for questions, um, gladly answer those. Thank you so much, Glenn. Um, yeah. We do have time for a question. Do you know what percentage of the coconut trees on Guam have been impacted and or lost by CRB? So I guess that's a, that's a really interesting question. I, I would say 100% of the coconut trees have been impacted by the coconut rhinoceros beetle, um, but it differs to varying degrees. So at different times of the year, since the coconut trees can recover, the damage isn't obvious. Dr. Moore from the University of Guam does roadside surveys to identify damaged trees. And through his roadside surveys, they can see 25% or one in every four trees has some sort of visible damage. And that's just visible damage. But if you look closer, you can see that almost every tree on the island has either a borehole or in the past, it's been hit by coconut rhinoceros beetle. But like the actual loss of coconut trees has never been quantified. Like how many dead coconut trees? But we've seen entire stands of coconut trees disappear and they get replaced with non-native palms. Uh, okay, Th thank you so much, Dr. Dulia. Uh, we're gonna move on uh, to the next presentation and that is me and I'm gonna get that going here. So thanks everybody for joining this Lessons Learned from Island Ecosystem session. Thanks to the two previous speakers for that amazing research and insight. My talk is about how climate change may impact invasive species in the U.S. Pacific Islands. We all have to define our term. So the definition of invasive species I'm going to be going with is a non-native organism whose introduction causes or is likely to cause economic or environmental harm or harm to human, animal, or plant health. And that's from the U.S. Executive Order, Safeguarding the Nation from the Impacts of Invasive Species in 2016. The Pacific Islands have an invasive species problem. I hope that comes out during this session. And to give you an uh, idea of the extent of this, uh, this is a USGS report uh, from 2018, illustrating the comparative density of non-native species richness. And so the dots represent the number of species per 10,000 square kilometers. And as you can see, compared to Alaska and the conterminous US, Hawaii is an example of a Pacific island has a much, much higher density of invasive species. In fact, it is 200 times higher than the US continent. And we know that invasive species drive the conservation crisis in the Pacific with many extinctions due to invasive species. The brown tree snake from Guam is an excellent example. And with a large richness of invasive species, a recent study showed that Pacific islands have the steepest increase uh, in the number of invasive species per land area across the entire globe. And this impacts rare species and drives uh, native species to decline. As an example here, the Hawaii makes up uh, only 0.2% of the U.S. land area. It contains a quarter of all species found on the Endangered Species Act and 44% of the threatened and endangered plants on the ESA list are from Hawaii. And this trend is not going away anytime soon. This is an excellent study by Dr. Kelsey Brock and Dr. Kurt Daler from the University of Hawaii at Manoa showing the number of naturalized plants over the last 120 years in Hawaii, naturalized being they have established populations, they're spreading on their own. And as you can see, the rate has likely increased in the last 12 years. Our rate right now is about 12 new naturalized plant species per year. But we know the Pacific Islands are also affected by a changing climate fairly dramatically and have been uh, affected by a changing climate for a long time. These impacts, of course, include ocean warming and acidification, sea level rise, severe drought, which has been shown by Dr. Abby Frazier and colleagues to have increased in severity and frequency of drought in Hawaii over the last hundred years, severe wildfires, changes in rainfall and 
increased storm intensity, as Dr. Glenn Delia mentioned. And we know that climate change and invasive species interact. And a lot of recent research points to those climate change uh, issues and impacts exacerbating uh, invasive species issues. So we really need to understand that to know how uh, to target and prioritize efforts, especially in places uh, like the Pacific Islands, where often uh, resources, including funding and staff, uh, are much lower than on the continent. Um, and we have a lot that's at risk. Um, the Pacific Islands are an area with an incredible biological and cultural diversity. Invasive species impact traditional livelihoods, they impact culture, they impact quality of life, they impact agricultural systems, and they really reduce island resilience and the opportunity to have sustainable systems set up. And so it's really critical to address this interaction on islands. So to address this on islands, the Pacific risk, regional invasive species and climate change management network was established in 2020 to deal with these independent and interacting threats. This is our leadership team. We've got members from all of the jurisdictions across Hawaii and the U.S. affiliated Pacific Islands. And our area is quite large. This region is much larger than the continental United States, including the ocean, and includes over 2,000 islands and more than 20 languages uh, spoken. A lot of these islands are small and isolated, leading to, to challenges. And so I just wanted to touch on uh, a few regional concerns, wildfire shifting distributions, extreme climatic events, which Dr. Dulia touched on, and, and sea level rise. Starting with wildfire, we know from the work of Dr. Clay Trironicht and others that wildfires burn a significant portion of the land area in Hawaii and on Guam and other Pacific Islands as well. And it's higher than the U.S. continent. So in this recent figure, 0.48% uh, burns annually in Hawaii compared to only 0.3% on the U.S. continent. And it's actually higher than the Western uh, states as well. Um, and these wildfires have significant impacts. Uh, the grass fire cycle is one with uh, a loss of native forest and increase in grass cover over time. Um, invasive grasses cover 25% of the land area uh, in Hawaii. And, you know, it not just impacts biological resources, but cultural resources. This is a picture showing impacts to a stone platform. Another regional concern is altered species distribution. And uh, species are expected to move towards the poles, up in elevation, and to deeper depths. And we have evidence from a number of taxonomic groups for projected range expansion from bees and fruit flies and mosquitoes to frogs, snails, plants, and algae. But we also have examples of range contraction, such as plants that are moving out of their habitat suitability in the future, likely, as well as inundation of low-lying islands with invasives. And all this points towards the needs for prioritization. One of our best known studies is the effect of invasive mosquitoes on the native Hawaiian forest birds. As the climate warms, invasive mosquitoes, which are temperature limited, uh, are often found at higher elevations, and avian malaria and avian pox are often fatal to these native forest birds. The two on the bottom left, Akikiki and Akeke, uh, are projected to go extinct in the wild due to this in just the next few years. And we know that habitat suitability is projected to change for plants as well. This is a study of the invasive vine, Moremia uh, peltata, showing that in the future, under multiple climate scenarios, this species would be suitable on entire islands that it's not currently suitable on. Dr. Dulia talked about extreme climatic events. This is a hurricane a few years ago approaching Hawaii Island. It was a Category 5 briefly and Category 4. And for Pacific Risk, we reviewed this study recently, but there is growing evidence that these extreme events are expected to worsen biological invasions. You did see the example of the coconut rhinoceros beetle in Guam as well. I wanted to point out that 
the coconut tree, which is considered the tree of life across the Pacific for many different cultural uses, for food, for water, it also holds the shoreline together in many low-lying islands. And so when you combine that with sea level rise, you're potentially looking at a large loss of coastal area due to this intersection of climate change and invasive species. And in fact, uh, coconut rhinoceros beetle was detected in the Republic of the Marshall Islands for the first time this last year. I do want to finish on uh, a hopeful note, although I know we'll have a couple of talks coming up soon that also offer hopeful notes. But this paper from Dr. Bethany Bradley in 2009 asked the question, will there be restoration opportunities ahead? And it had projected maps of cheatgrass showing that, you know, if some of these invasive species are shifting, you know, what are we going to do in those areas that may no longer be suitable habitat for those species? And so there's a huge opportunity, I believe, for restoration on Pacific islands. This is in the lowland dry forest and has gone from, in just a few years, invasive, dominated fountain grass areas uh, to this thriving uh, native plant community with over 70 different uh, uh, native Hawaiian endemic species planted. Um, but I do want to point out that this area um, is currently uh, lowland dry forest now, but is expected to become shrubland in the future of the, with a biome shift basically across all of the climate change scenarios we've looked at. So we really need to think carefully about what these future conditions might be like, and then how do we design restoration efforts um, because of that. And so what we need is disturbance-ready restoration practices. We have EDRR, early detection rapid response for invasive eradication, but you know we need a new paradigm. We need post-disturbance rapid restoration. So PDRR, if you haven't heard of it, there you go. It's something that we need to develop. And as an example, the University of Hawaii had a record setting 1,000 trees planted in just two hours in October 2018. We really need to scale up these efforts. I know I'm out of time, so mahalo nui loa, and thank you so much for uh, the opportunity uh, to present here today and for being there to listen. If you are doing work or research in this area, please do get in touch with us uh, with a Pacific risk. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and answer any questions in the Q&A. Tony Lynn coming from the ether. So Jessica has a question that sounds like a good one for everybody, but maybe you can take it on. You mentioned a lack of staff and a lack of funding. Of course, I think we all recognize the lack of funds, but is the lack of staff due to the lack of funds? Or is it possible that organizations are maintaining a small hiring pool? due to refusal to hire passionate individuals who happen to not have the desired level of experience? That, you know, the reasons for that are complicated, and I'll just put out one example, and that's a recent article published in the Civil Beat, assessed and quantified how many workers or employees left since the pandemic, and I believe it was 15,000, if I'm remembering correctly, left the Pacific Islands probably for many reasons, you know, inflation has driven up prices, it's gotten more expensive to live here. And so that's one reason is a smaller workforce overall is a likely contributing factor, but it is difficult. And uh, I'll try to think of a more in-depth and detailed question, put that in the Q&A. Um, okay, well, uh, let's move on to our next speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce David Will, Head of Innovation from Island Conservation. Um, and his talk is on towards the quantification of the climate co-benefits of invasive mammal eradication on islands, a scalable framework for restoration monitoring. Um, please take it away, David, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much and really appreciate the talks today and all the other speakers. It's really an honor and a privilege to be um, speaking with you all today. And as Elliot mentioned, I'll be talking about uh, a pilot study that we did looking at the potential climate co-benefits of invasive mammal eradication on islands and how to monitor those over time. 
So as been, has been talked about by a number of other speakers, we know that islands are hotspots of diversity and uniqueness, and that invasive species are a leading cause of extinction on islands, and islands are also particularly uh, impacted by uh, the threats of climate change and other impacts. You know, really invasive mammals in particular are one of the, one of the leading causes of extinction on island, with more than 86% of extinctions contributed to invasive mammals. But we also know that islands offer hope and that there's been more than 800 islands around the world where invasive species have been removed and seen restoration following those interventions. And pictured here, you can see the ecological change on an island in Chile before and after rabbit removal. Yet, despite all these interventions, there are still a small number of eradications that have actually measured ecological change over time on islands. As um, Dr. Bayer was going to talk about a little bit, there's continuing to be emerging evidence of the uh, ecosystem resilience uh, brought on by removing invasive uh, mammals from islands, um, restoring native vegetation pictured here is Palmyra Atoll uh, in the Pacific and seeing a 5,000% increase in native vegetation uh, within five years of invasive rodent removal. Um, but we also see that there's important nutrient cycling benefits from seabirds um, uh, recovery on islands and the cascading nutrient that flows into the marine environment. But it's also uh, you know, to point out that many of these islands represent globally unique native carbon stocks, and that we can see changes in those native carbon stocks over time from removing invasive mammals on islands. But as we know that all these ecological changes take lots of time, some of these are on the order of 10 to 20 or more years, and that because islands are remote, that is very expensive to conduct uh, ground-based monitoring over long time scales, and that at, you know it can limit our spatial coverage. So there has been some work in the remote sensing space to be able to look at ecological changes on islands over time. And so we've been looking at a lot of different methods that we've been using over time, but they often use different inconsistent consistent methodologies that make it hard to compare the collective global impact of invasive mammal eradications globally. And even more so, very few of those are looking at carbon stocks and carbon fluxes and um, how those might be changing on time, um, which we know in the kind of the climate policy space that there's a lot of talk about carbon stocks and fluxes. And so islands are really missing from that conversation about um, how can this be a nature-based solution for climate adaptation and mitigation. So we thought, how can we develop a monitoring system that cost-effectively evaluates us at a global scale? Looking around, there's been a lot of digital monitoring, reporting, and verification methods that are used across the conservation space and uh, other interventions. And so we thought, how could we apply those to this invasive mammal eradication on islands? And sought to design a monitoring framework to evaluate this at a global level. Um, we use standard measures of tree cover, forest cover, and forest carbon and NDVI using Landsat data from as far back as data was available from 1984 till 2020. Um, and then using scalable software as a service, so kind of planning computer, cloud computing resources to be able to do this at a global annual scale over time across a thousand islands around the world. And this provided a baseline assessment of ecosystem accounting that could be improved over time to measure these climate benefits. So what did this framework look like? We worked with TerraPulse, a remote sensing data company that used some remote sensing MODIS data to create annual estimates of tree canopy cover at a 30 meters of resolution for each of these islands, and then also created annual estimates of NDVI. So that's vegetation data that shows uh, greenness as a proxy for biomass. So those uh, annual estimates were created for each of those islands. And then we worked with another company, Flint Pro, which has a software as a service carbon accounting module that does spatially explicit estimates of change over time. So we took that tree canopy cover estimate and applied a 20% canopy threshold, considering forest to be anything with greater than 20% tree canopy cover. And using this um, particular method, there is an IPCC tier one estimate that allows you to look at the global ecoregion, so an island that's in the tropical Pacific, what is the general biomass value for moist tropical forest in the tropical Pacific, and then there's a growth curve associated with that. So each individual pixel had a forest or not forest classification, and then over time, if there was a forest gain or a forest loss, loss, you could track at, at the pixel level the gain in forest or the loss in forest over time. And I think that growth curve in particular is important to think about. There's a point at which the total biomass has matured and you've reached a, a mature forest. And also that this is a modeled approach. So if there's a gap in between with your data, it interpolates either a forest loss or a forest loss event at an individual pixel level.
So we used all these indices to look at a trend analysis of before and after eradication, and then deployed those into some shiny web applications I'll share in a minute. So this is the geographic scope of the islands that were covered. So a thousand islands around the world that covered 17 different ecoregions. And these were drawn from uh, databases that we house that show uh, where eradications have been successful on about 800 islands. And then also looking at future globally important islands um, where uh, uh, invasive mammal eradication is possible um, over time in the future. And that was how we selected all of these different ecoregions. So to give you an idea of what this looks like, here are two different islands, Santa Cruz Island and the California Channel Islands and Socorro in Mexico. You're seeing the tree canopy cover data here in green changing over time. And it's important to notice that in this tree canopy cover data set, there's black and there's areas of no data and gaps in the data. And as you can see in the charts, you know those are kind of mean average estimates of the tree canopy cover and biomass values. But because we have that simulation, we're able to interpolate changes in forest extent and biomass and overcome some of those issues with gaps in the data because of the earth observation information. Um, here's another way of visualizing those. This is at a decadal scale, again, from Santa Cruz, uh, California Islands, and Socorro and the Baja California Islands, showing uh, carbon uh, change, both loss and gain at a per pixel level from between 2000 and 2010, and also between 2010 and 2020. And so both of these are ways of showing that there are different areas of carbon of forest change and ecosystem extent over different time periods. And you can see that there's areas of both gain and loss as a result of a variety of different conditions on these islands. I won't dwell on this one too much other than to say here's a link to where um, you can visualize these maps. So we have those same level of decadal maps and annual maps for all of the thousand islands um, that we're in the study um, at this link here. Um, and then, you know, showing an example again of how did the per island trend analysis look. Um, here again is Santa Cruz Island, the California Channel Islands. There's a photo um, from another study uh, on the ground showing the change before and after of the forest change. And Santa Cruz Island had a long history of invasions with uh, multiple invasive herbivores and uh, turkeys and other species that have been removed um, over the last um, 20 or more years. And you can see the ecological change here um, over time across the different indices. And I want to point out that that dashed line we, is the interrupted time series analysis we did looking at before and after eradication change. In this example, because turkeys were the most recent uh, invasion uh, for the interrupted time series analysis, you don't see a great before and after trend because there's already been a lot of trends happening beforehand, but you can see overall a large magnitude of change both in forest extent and also in, in forest carbon stock uh, change as well as NDVI across the entire island. And same here on Socorro Island in Mexico, the same sort of uh, ecological change with a, a graphic there of the change before and after invasive uh, sheep removal and similar things with forest area and forest carbon stocks. And I think, again, important to point out that there's a serious gap in the tree canopy cover because there was a lack of satellite data. But because we had this modeled approach, we were able to model the ecological changes on those using that per pixel interpolation approach to be able to still be able to estimate changes in forest extent and carbon stock over over time on that particular island. So where does all this lead to? Here's kind of just a general look at the overall trends across islands from this data set. We can see a general increase in tree cover and DVI and forest carbon extent. I think it's important to point out that there's some serious cliffs there. You can see that the number of islands with satellite coverage had some dramatic cliffs as different satellites came online or the archival data came into play. So there's clearly some limitations in our ability to look at really historical eradication events and have enough pre and post eradication data to be able to look at that. And so, you know, really in a lot of ways before 2000, there was a smaller number of islands that had any data that you could draw some conclusions from. But because we had the sim simulation models with the Flint Pro system, we you know there were some modeling that was done of baseline assumptions. So taking all of those data, we did the interrupted time series analysis that we showed on the Santa Cruz and Socorro Island across all these islands that had more than five years of pre and post eradication data. And we did a meta-analysis of the mean effect size across all those islands with eradication. And you can see here, 
pre-eradication trends, immediate effects, so effects within one year, sustained effects, so it would be effects of before and after of more than five years from eradication. And then there's a set of simulated islands, and those are islands where eradication has not yet occurred, but we simulated an eradication event to see if we could still detect um, changes on those islands before and after a particular event. And you can see here generally that there was sustained positive effects across all these indices on islands with eradication. We did an initial exploration of some of the potential covariating effects of those things, looking at what kind of invasive, was it an herbivore, an omnivore, a carnivore, what country, ecoregion, island area, a variety of different effects. And then the one that came out really clearly across all of this was that country was significant across all of these indices. And I think that really points to that each of these individual countries and islands has their own unique invasion histories and that there are a lot of nuances in these sorts of studies to be able to really tease out was uh, eradication the driving effect compared to precipitation and climate change. Uh, uh, and, you know, thinking about some of the other talks earlier, hurricanes and other climatic events that could also influence our ability to measure pre and post uh, ecological change on islands. So what are some of the key results from all this? When we looked across all those thousand islands, those islands represented more than 940,000 hectares of forest, representing 53 million tons of total forest carbon. We detected sustained effects across all of these indices on islands with eradications, but we found that those effects were highly variable and further site-specific investigation was needed. And so what does all of this mean? You know, Taken kind of collectively, looking at the, the size of the area, the amount of carbon stocks, um, globally, these interventions on islands represent a meaningful opportunity to restore important carbon stocks. And that this framework really does provide us a new way to be able to measure those ecological changes and integrate invasive species eradication on islands into climate policy discussions and to management plans and thinking about how can we be measuring these things over time. And this can be really improved. There's multiple different tiers of those measurements that we can do. And so this is really just a first pilot study baseline estimate that we can continue to improve this over time, um, which will be particularly exciting. As part of that, we have uh, some current funding from both NASA and Salesforce Nature Accelerator to take this uh, framework to the next step and improve it, looking at using LIDAR and uh, spaceborne LIDAR and high resolution imagery to be able to look at sub canopy ecosystem structure change, looking at multi class approaches for carbon stock modeling. So, going from forest to grassland or grassland to wetland, and then also looking at higher tier carbon stock modeling approaches and partnering with others to look at causal effect of eradications. And uh, an important part of that is going to be really looking at 10 to 20 islands where we can do some validation and control and really partnering with others to say, you know, how does this system work? How does this inform our decision making? So with that, I probably am at about time. And so thank you to all the co-authors and funders for this and happy to answer any questions if there's time. Thank you so much, David. Uh, I am just pulling up the q and I think we have time for a, a quick question. This is from Annie Simpson. Did you get a chance to ground truth your results? If so, how or where and how did your modeling predictions stack up with real life trends? Yeah, that's a great question. I think we did some cursory investigations of validating the, those examples on Socorro and Santa Cruz Island gave us positive indications that those are islands we knew there was ecosystem change. We were able to detect that ecosystem change on those islands. But really, this next step with the, the NASA Salesforce Accelerator work is to really do a much more rigorous validation model. This was kind of a move quickly, break things sort of approach for the pilot study. And really, this next phase is validating those things moving forward. Uh, great. Thank you so much. We're going to move on to our uh, next and final talk in this um, Lessons Learned from Island Ecosystem session. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Patty Bio. Uh, she is Director of Partnerships at Island Conservation, and her talk is Island Restoration, the Role of Invasive Species and Eradications. Um, please take it away, Patty, whenever you're ready. Thank you, Elliot, and thanks, everybody, for great talks before this one, and I'm excited to be here and participate. And what I'll talk to you guys today a little bit to is some examples of island restoration success through invasive species eradications on islands. The reason why we focus on islands is because they are incredibly amazing places. Um, so islands represent only about 5% of the Earth's um, landmass, but they carry 
a disproportionate amount of both biodiversity and cultural diversity. So if you look at the numbers here on the screen, about 20% of all avian biodiversity are island species, and about 11% of all of the people in the world are island co communities. But they're also the stage, unfortunately, of most of the extinctions that we've seen historically. So looking at the numbers again, about 75% of all extinctions of birds, amphibians, mammals, and reptiles have happened on islands. And they continue on that path of extinction with about 41% of all of the currently endangered species being island species. Of the extinction events, 86% of those um, invasive species have been implicated um, in the extinction. So the reason why island conservation focus on removing invasive species on islands is because it's a high return on investment when you remove that one large threat to native um, species, then you have um, incredible outcomes uh, that follow. And, and as we know, you know, these um, species are really just the building blocks of ecosystems. And by compromising these ecosystems, uh, invasive species currently represent an existential threat to many um, island communities around the globe. Uh, we know that these communities uh, are heavily reliant on those natural resources and the livelihoods are in the forefront of the uh, climate crisis that we're all talking about here today. So having sustainable solutions to climate change in these communities start with uh, resilient ecosystems that can be their first line of defense against many of the severe uh, consequences of climate change, such, such as weather events and sea level rise and, and so on and so forth. Um, but there is hope. Um, so today what, what I'll show you is um, some success stories of um, eradications attempts on um, islands. And I can honestly say that eradications are an available tool that has been proven successful over and over again. The map here is about 1,200 uh, dots that represent all of the attempted um, eradication efforts on islands across the world. And the success rate is close to 90%. So we can say safely that we have been able to um, extract principles of eradication that can be replicated um, at, at different scales. And there are many different islands that can still benefit from this tool uh, being implemented uh, worldwide. So what I'll do next is just walk you through some of these uh, great examples of island restorations through the removal of invasive species. And our first um, stop here is uh, Palmyra Atoll which is um, on the Lion Islands in the tropical Pacific, um, just uh, south of um, Hawaii. And it's now a thriving seabird colony and a thriving um, ecosystem, but that wasn't the case about 10 years ago uh, when uh, rats um, were infesting the island and uh, causing some severe impacts to the native um, species on the island. And so in 2011, we implemented that red eradication in partnership with the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Nature Conservancy, and completely eradicated the rats uh, from Palmyra et al. And the results speak for themselves. I think Dave already um, showed this picture, but I'll, I'll, I'll go in a little more detail. But the rats were severely impacting the Pisonia forest, uh, which is a um, threatened ecosystem around the globe. Um, and they uh, were, uh, impacting it primarily by uh, eating seeds and um, uh, impeding their recruitment into the population. So in six years after the eradication of rats, what we had seen is a 5,000% increase on the uh, recruitment of seedlings into the population, which then you know, translated into healthy Pisonia forests across the atoll. And what that means is that Pisonia is the primary and preferred nesting habitat for many of the 11 species of seabirds that currently nest on Palmyra. So by increasing the Pisonia forest, we were able to also increase the uh, recruitment of seabirds and uh, their nesting um, uh, success on the islands. And that includes um, the uh, boobies, red-footed boobies and brown boobies and many other seabirds as well. Another group that greatly benefited from uh, the, the rat eradication were the crabs. Um, so the coconut crabs are prevalent on Palmyra. And since the eradication, we've been able to detect two new species. And I put quote in quote because what we think was happening is that the rats were suppressing the population of these species to 
below detection levels. And since the rats have been gone, the crabs have uh, rebound. And so we're now able to detect them um, in the population, increasing the number of species uh, recorded on Palmyra. And the example on Palmyra is also great to share because um, there's been so many studies that have correlated the success on the terrestrial piece following the eradication with the marine success as well. So if you peek out of the forest, that dark Pisonia forest, and you look into the marine ecosystem on Palmyra, what we've seen is that the seabirds act as connector species. So seabirds will feed out at sea and they will bring those nutrients back to the island and through their droppings, the guano, they will not only fertilize the land and increase productivity on the island, but eventually those droppings and that guano gets washed back into the ocean and increases the nutrient levels at the near shore environment as well. So what we've seen is that if you compare islands with and without rats, the near shore environments, including coral reefs and seagrass beds and, and even a little bit more you know, offshore have benefited from that um, re restoration of nu nutrient cycles from land to sea and, and vice versa. So by doing island eradications of invasive species, we're not only benefiting the terrestrial species, but also the marine um, ecosystems that surround um, those islands. The next example is the Secheo Islands in Puerto Rico. And again, this is an incredibly amazing place with a very high level of endemism, species that only happen on the Secheo. And that includes many reptile species, the Desecheo anole, the Desecheo uh, ameva, and dwarf gecko. And before the rats were introduced many, many years ago, there were reported large colonies of breeding seabirds that included brown boobies, red bo red footed boobies, and many others. And it's also home to endemic plants like the Higo Chumbo um, cactus that is also endangered. And so removing the rats would also benefit them. So in 2016, the USDA, Fish and Wildlife Service, Island Conservation, and the Puerto Rico Department of Natural Resources got together and we implemented rodent eradication to completely remove the rats from the Secheo. And the story that follows is very similar to Palmyra in that we've seen natural recovery of the ecosystem of the vegetation, the Higo Chumbo cactus is doing really well. And what the Secheo has provided us is an opportunity to accelerate that restoration process of, in particular, the seabird colonies. Seabirds are colonial birds, so they nest in these large colonies on islands and coastal areas, and they're attracted to large colonies. So on the Secheo, we have implemented a social attraction program which really means that we're trying to trick birds into thinking that there is a very large colony of birds that are already established on the island and hope to attract them to nest on the island as well. So we have been focusing our efforts on three species, the brown knotty and the brittle tern. And those two had been previously recorded, historically recorded on the Secheo and are still present, although in, we're still present with the rats in low numbers as well as the um, Audubon shearwater, which had been documented on the Secheo, but completely extirpated from the island uh, because of the rats. And the way we do the social attraction is by using decoys and mirrors, and also broadcasting the calls of those specific species out into the nearby flying uh, birds to attract them onto the island. Again, giving them the impression that there is a very large colony already established on the island, and they should come join it. And what we've seen is some really interesting uh, results that are uh, heartwarming and gives us a lot of hope. So in the last survey, we have observed uh, about 20 eggs and 10 chicks of the brittle turns and the brown noddies as well. We have been able to observe nesting of the birds on the island and brooding adults surrounding that same nesting spot, which gives us hope that they will become nesting pairs in the future. And as well with the Audubon Shearwater for the first time in a very long time, we've been able to uh, observe a, a nest and a chick of Audubon Shearwater on the Sitio. And what that has done is create the opportunity and the baseline data of success to really help the Fish and Wildlife Service and local partners to continue and expand on this social attraction program. And so they've been able to secure um, additional funding to continue the program, but also to invest 
uh, more heavily on biosecurity um, to maintain the island uh, rent free in perpetuity. And um, they're also looking to um, eradicate the remaining invasive species on the island that is still causing um, depredation of chicks and eggs, which is the uh, green iguana. Um, so hoping to eradicate that in the near future um, as well. Aside from those three species that were socially attracting, other species have been thriving all on their own. And this includes the frigate birds and brown boobies and Zenaida doves and American oyster catchers and many others. So it's a huge success story that implementing this one tool and removing this one threat can have this rippling benefits to whole ecosystem recoveries and with that improved climate resilience and, and livelihoods on islands that are utilized or inhabited by human communities. So aside from these few examples that I gave more in depth, you know, I think I just wanted to end with the hopeful note that even though there's a lot of uh, gloom and doom uh, when we talk about climate change and um, invasive species, we have uh, tools in the toolbox that have been proven effective um, and that can be replicated and opportunities abound um, worldwide to implement these tools and the benefits that we know uh, they have and in, in measuring even beyond the biodiversity benefits as, as David has pointed out, you know, is, is something that we're looking to do in terms of climate carbon stocks and all of those things. So here's just a few more just to send you home or end up this session with hope, hope, and hope. So here's an example of a new snail species that were found on Rabida Island after the rodent eradication on Anacapa in California. We saw four times more Scripps murrelets nests and 50% increase of their eggs hatching once the rats were removed from Anacapa. Galapagos tortoise hatchlings, they can now survive on Pinzon Island unassisted. So prior to the eradication, the hatchlings had to be kept in captivity until they were rat-proof size, and then they were reintroduced into the island. Now with the rats gone from Pinzon, they can reproduce on the island naturally, and the first hatchlings of the Galapagos have been documented. And looking into the marine ecosystem in the Chagos Archipelago, what they saw with the rat free islands was that they had 50% more fish biomass on the reefs adjacent to those islands. So again, the, the effects go well beyond just the terrestrial ecosystem and we're really feeding healthy corals and resilient oceans uh, by doing um, island eradications as well. So with that, thank you very much. And um, again, it's a pleasure to be here and happy to answer any questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Baya. It was so great to finish this session with success stories and you have such beautiful pictures and results and stories to share. I did want to do a quick question before we move on to the next. And there's a question on the rapidity of the restoration of forests on Palmyra. Somebody said it, it, it seems extremely fast. I was hoping you could comment on, on kind of what drives that rate of recovery. Yeah, again, I mean, these island ecosystems are very resilient ecosystems, right? And, and their species are, uh, a lot of them endemic and adapted to those conditions. And the invasive species are really one of the major threats that uh, put them at risk. Um, so by removing those, you know, they can really rebound uh, pretty quickly. And, and you're right, I mean, compared to other conservation interventions and the timescales that it takes for other ecosystems, it is quite quick that we are able to document those changes. And I don't know what to say other than, you know, these species are, they have everything else they need and their biggest pressure on their populations is the invasive species. So by removing them, you just give them the chance to utilize the resources that are available and, and thrive. Thank you so much again. There are a few questions in the Q&A that, that you could address afterwards. Thank you to all the session speakers and uh, great to hear about what's happening on islands and how islands can serve as a model system for continents. And we're moving on to the next part. How you doing, Elliot? Doing good. Yeah, I feel good. Thanks everyone. So we've been sharing this Menti poll throughout uh, yesterday and today, and we're going to now show you the results. And there's still time, so maybe Dia can drop the link in one more time. You can see somebody else just added. So you can see that we are um, from all over 
uh, the world here at this meeting. I'm a little skeptical of the Antarctica blob, but if you are from here from Antarctica, <laughs> do put in the chat. We're all curious. <laughs> anyway, it's super. And as we move this meeting from the inaugural meeting to the next year, we can maybe think about um, how we can bring in non more nor non North Americans. And we've showed this a few times, but you haven't seen all the rest of the results. So yeah, go ahead, Elliot. We'll just kind of jump back and forth here. So the next question was, what organization do you work for? Uh, state, territorial government had a lot of responses um, at 166. We've also got a second and third place around a tie for national federal government and NGO. And definitely shows us we need to reach out more to different sectors, private and corporate, as well as academia. Yeah, and if there's another there that you feel like we really should have left in there, you know, just send us a chat and we'll get it in the next time. And I see people adding, it's great. Okay, I know this isn't perfect, partly in part, of course, because I have a typo, which has really bothered me, but it was too late, but we wanted to mix up the kinds of questions. So this is as a this or that in mentee. So I realized that there are not just two categories. But it looks like generally, if we forced you to put yourself in one blob circle here or the other, that we have about twice as many managers and practitioners at the meeting than researchers and scientists. And for many of us researchers, I think that's really good news because we spend a lot of time going to meetings where we are researchers just with researchers. So it's exciting for me to see this distribution. Next slide and question, what taxa do you primarily work with? And it looks like terrestrial plants. We've got a really good uh, group of you here. Thanks so much for coming. Also aquatic, which is a little bit lower, invertebrates, vertebrates, followed by freshwater plants and marine. So we'll definitely do some more outreach, especially for aquatic and marine ecosystems in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And lots of people who do lots, you know, um, cover them all. And I just want to say I've been so happy at this meeting about the diversity of um, topics we've covered with the speakers. So those of you that might feel underrepresented in the audience, hopefully still felt represented among the speakers. So I realize this one might be a little confusing, so I'll just spend a second on it. I think basically you're saying I, I generally focus on current issues. You can see the skew of the distribution. There's lots of people who strongly agreed with that. And then most people strongly disagreed with the idea of focusing on future issues. So even though the midpoint, the average is actually very close, mostly you're all focusing on current issues and not really focusing on future issues, which of course, as we know from the ADR curve and thinking about things that are on the horizon as climate changes that we wanna maybe be shifting these curves a bit. What is your preferred term? This is really interesting because terminology has been a subject of this conference. And the winner right now is non-native species at 418 compared to other, which I'm really curious about the other. So if you folks could definitely put in what your preferred terms are, if you're in the other category, let us know in the chat, that would be great. Non-indigenous species are a little bit lower down followed by alien species. So we really wanted to know what you feel is important criteria to include in the definition of invasive species. There are different uses in different places, different regions. And so we could divide that up into impacts. Some definitions include impact, like a negative impact or negative effect. Others do not. Geographic criterion. So that's the idea that you're moving a species outside of its current range. And then followed by anthropogenic criterion. So do humans have to be directly involved with that transport for it to be an invasive species or can that be indirect? And indirect causes include shifts, rain shifts due to things like pollution, changes in land use or climate change. And so it looks to me like the results are impact criterion is, is the most important to you all followed by geographic. And interesting that direct and indirect are about a tie. I don't know, Tony Lynn, if you want to add to anything. No, that's great. I am trying to keep an eye on the chat. And I did want to point out from this previous question, if I can, that the reason we didn't put 
invasive is that I didn't want to conflate those two ideas as we try to keep those things separate, that the invasive is not a synonym for these things, right? Lots and lots of non-native species that have no negative impacts, so are not actually invasive. So anyway, <laughs> I'm just seeing some things in the chat. Okay, this is a fun one. I realize you can't see all these words, but we will be sharing this back when we share the recording and which we'll share hopefully by early next week. So I love this, it's changing as we're staring at it. This first question is what current invasive species are you most concerned about? But you can see that knotweed, EAB, spotted lanternfly, Phragmites, Japanese knotweed, Asiatic bittersweet. So there's some things in here that are like common, problems, at least where I say I am in the United States, not surprising, but lots and lots of other ones out there too. And these are weighted sized by how many people answered. And so basically anything that's not teeny, teeny, tiny out in the edges, you're not alone. Other people agreed that that's a problem. And we talked about a lot of these throughout the day and yesterday. So that's really exciting. And uh, so this is the what current invasive species are you most concerned about? And then I'm gonna to switch to the next slide. That's what future ones, and you'll see it's not the same. And I'll throw that over to Elliot. So looking at this word cloud, looks like we've got some similar ones in the middle, kudzu, spotted land, and turn fly, knotweed is in there. But uh, yeah, it'll be really interesting to compare these lists and find out what's common uh, to both as well as what's different. Awesome. All right, as you incorporate climate change into invasive species work, you know, this is a, as we expected. I mean, at this meeting, this is a biased sample, of course. So we we're hoping that everyone would feel like they do, but it's not surprising that many people, most people said less than they'd like. And, and lots of people, even at this meeting, said that they don't. So hopefully, inspiration and information from the last two days will help you do more of that. I'll just say quickly this is a question that we're wondering about whether kind of information access or funding affect whether you incorporate climate change and this one ended up basically the same answer so we're just going to keep going and i'll throw the next one to elliot so do you think management has been gaining or losing ground on invasive species and uh, it looks like gaining ground the peak is kind of right in the middle um losing ground though there's definitely more votes for a strongly agree for the losing ground um, too bad we can't do this uh, before and after Dr. Bio's talk at the end of the last session. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks so much for answering this question. Excellent. All right. So this is the most fun part, and there are 352 of these. So again, we'll share these back, but you can just see. So I, I thought nothing was more depressing than working on climate change until I started working on invasive species and climate change. Maybe some of you think that way about invasive species. I thought we'd throw you this question, like what keeps you going? What keeps you optimistic? What keeps you waking up and getting going to work in the morning? So there's so many wonderful comments here. I don't know if Elliot, you want to point any out. Ooh, passion. I like that one. Community support. Love for the land. That's great. Good people doing good conservation. It's like, you know, beauty, community, passion. I love what I do. I also love what I do. <laughs> Seeing success stories. I loved that whole session that was just run on the success stories. A better tomorrow, love for the land, small victories. Yeah, just terrific. So yeah, I think there's such great um, fodder here for optimism. And I think with that, we're gonna hand over our last, I think it's our last research session to Paul. Hi, Paul, it's good to see you here. <laughs> and Paul will be introducing our speakers to the session. And thanks for everyone for taking part in our audience participation. All right, thanks. Thanks, thanks Thailand. Thanks, Elliot. I love those 357 responses and I feel like we just need eight more and we have our motivation per day calendar for the next year. So very, very cool stuff. Well, welcome everyone. This is the last session of presentations for this inaugural ISC and I'm Paul Heimowitz. I'm the Terrestrial Invasive Species Program Manager for the U.S. Geological Survey and I have the honor of hosting this second round of lightning talks. Uh, we have five presentations 
that'll focus on emerging research. They may be brief in length, but they are long in relevant information. And uh, if you miss any of the content, so again, a reminder that the sessions are being recorded, so you'll have that as a resource later. During the course of this amazing conference, we've heard a lot of ongoing science needs at the intersection of climate change and invasive species, needs related to prevention, to control effectiveness, surveillance, uh, impact evaluation, other critical research areas that inform management. And we have a fabulous lineup of presenters in this session who together will cover a number of those research themes just within their five talks, again, offering hope for new tools and solutions on the horizon. Just a reminder to use the Q&A option to type in any questions that pop into your mind during the presentations. We won't have a lot of time to get to maybe all of them given the lightning round mode, but again, hopefully speakers will have an opportunity to follow up after the session. And first up is Dr. Camille Hopkins, who I'm fortunate to have as a colleague and teammate at the U.S. Geological Survey. And Dr. Hopkins will be giving a presentation on invasive species at the Wildlife Disease Interface. Hello, everyone. Um, so for my presentation, I'm a wildlife veterinarian and disease ecologist. I wanted to start out with this photo of Humpback Chub, a school in swimming in the Grand Canyon. And the reason I put them there is because this species is impacted, unfortunately, by an invasive parasite. So USGS is the science agency of the Department of the Interior. I sit in the ecosystems mission area. We're focused on ecosystem science, and notably, if you look in the blue circle here, drivers of ecosystem change, which includes disturbances like invasive species and wildlife disease. Here's where we sit in the organization of ecosystems. And uh, today I'm gonna talk about, as a disease ecologist, I'm interested in the interface between invasive species and disease, which can take several forms. So I'm gonna highlight a few examples and close with a call to action. So green crab, an important marine invasive species, provide a good example of the enemy release hypothesis. Based on that hypothesis, scientists found that there is evidence to show that when we look at the native range of this species compared to the introduced, which is in green, you can see that there is a significant drop in the prevalence of parasites, that's A and B, and the exposure to predators quantified as limb loss shown in C. The authors also found that Green crab, if you notice uh, on this figure, the white circles, those are green crabs that have been in their in introduced range, black being the native range. And what you can see is that the carapace width in A and the catch per unit effort in B are highest in introduced green crab and across the x-axis low prevalence of uh, parasites and enemies. In terms of invasive species spreading native diseases, feral swine are a good example. We know that they can spread pig pathogens like pseudorabies, but they can also spread winter ticks, which can have an important impact on moose populations. In my own research, I found that invasive mosquitoes can persist in areas where native mosquitoes do not exist and as a result, allow for range expansion and persistence of native pathogens like lacrosse encephalitis virus. These are just snapshots of some of the invasive species that USGS and other partners are studying that are impacting wildlife across the nation. And a well-known example, of course, is unfortunately avian malaria in Hawaiian honey creepers. So these Hawaiian forest birds um, are impacted by an invasive parasite carried by an invasive mosquito um, that unfortunately is causing significant declines in abundance. And as a result, we see shifts in the plant and bird communities with invasive species 
filling the gap that those uh, forest birds were previously filling in terms of an ecosystem niche and causing significant shifts in Hawaii. Now, when it comes to climate change and invasive pathogens, there are really four key things that we're watching for and that we're already seeing. Increasing severity and frequency of unusual mortality events in wildlife, shifting distribution of species and modeling of various invasive species like vampire bats suggests that unfortunately this shifting distribution is just beginning. Phenological changes, trophic mismatch between predator and prey species, um, and then emerging pathogens that are impacting not only the health of wildlife, but also public health, environmental health, and domesticated animal health. So how do we deal with invasive pathogens and wildlife health with our changing climate? We need to manage for health, not disease, thinking about resiliency um, in populations. We need to think about systematic health surveillance. In fact, we need to overlap information on invasive species and disease to better understand how both of these stressors are impacting wildlife. Climate adaptation strategies, which you've already heard, of, heard about, and a systems approach. Finally, we need to uh, enhance our utilization of tools to identify these invasive pathogens and their impact. So whether that's genomics, development of better detection tools like a lamp assay for that humpback chub parasite that I showed you, understanding the impact like white nose syndrome on bats by understanding where bat populations are, monitoring them, and better understanding how the disease is affecting them, data visualization tools like the upcoming AquaDep, which will overlay aquatic invasive species data with aquatic pathogens data, and finally taking a proactive response for those diseases that unfortunately might impact wildlife here in the U.S., like B. sal, a chytrid fungus of salamander in Europe. This is a quick example of a climate adaptation tool that's been developed for avian malaria. And with that, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Camille. That was excellent. And we actually have time for some questions. And this, I think, is more of a comment, but maybe you can respond to it. Gary, thanks you for bringing up the topic and notes pathogens are a huge invasive species issue that's not well understood, with many larger invasive species bringing invasive pathogens with them and uh, that making the work of Customs and Border Protection, APHIS and other state agencies more critical. So anything you'd like to comment on that, on that thought? Um, so, uh, first, thanks for that comment. Yes, this is a challenge. There's a lot of work to be done. Um, we are literally finding emerging diseases in wildlife, and then a year or two years later, realizing, actually, this is an invasive pathogen. That's why I'm saying characterization is really important, but also the reality of what you've all been talking about the last day and a half is the issue with disease. There are many ways, unfortunately, with globalization, habitat change, et cetera, that we're seeing introduction and um, persistence of invasive pathogens, in this case, impacting wildlife health. And so we've really got to think about not only how do we manage invasive species, which you can often, not always, right, but you can do eradication efforts Whereas with invasive pathogens in wildlife, that is really hard to try to eradicate. So we have to think about how do we respond proactively, or if they're already here, how do we help systems adapt, ecosystems adapt to the changes caused by these pathogens? Great. Thanks, Camille. There are a couple of questions in here I'll let you follow up on just about access to information in your slides. But next question, we have time for one more for you. This is from a former APHIS DVM who notes it's an uphill battle for non-ag pathogens and says, thanks for your hard work. And then asks, what can private vets do to monitor or help this problem? For private vets, there are a couple of things. One is trying to keep up with the literature on some of these, what USDA would call foreign animal diseases, 
exotic or invasive pathogens, but also if you're seeing wildlife, like I know for dog and cat vets, sometimes someone will walk in the door with injured wildlife or an exotic pet. If there are health issues, collaborating or communicating with your local wildlife veterinarians, which could include a state wildlife veterinarian, uh, most states now have them so that they're aware of any emerging disease issues that come up. So that's, those are a couple of thoughts. Fabulous. All right. Thanks, Camille. I think we'll need to move on to, uh, to our next presentation. And again, the, um, you'll see a few more questions there in the Q&A you could respond to if you have a chance. Um, but it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Martin Nunez with the University of Houston, who will speak to us on trees as a tool to fight climate change. You're all set. Take it away. Yeah, hello. Yeah, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Today, I will do a, a talk about trees as a tool to fight climate change. I work with invasive trees, which I consider a big problem. So, for example, this is in Chile, year two, two, 2007, 2011, 2015. 2017, we see that these like dry grasslands become like forests very fast, no? and with that like generates many, many, many problems. Uh, and we all here agree that, yeah, that, that invasive species are a huge problem. They generate billions in costs, like people suffer, loss of, of species, it's a terrible, terrible problem. But there are other important problems, as we clearly know and we have he been hearing before. One of them is climate change. Right? fires, like storms, sea level rise, many, many of these problems we are facing, many of us directly. And they, they as, as, as you know, are driven by like greenhouse gases, you know, like greenhouse gases have been going up, climate change happened, like we, we all know that. And on, on the other side of the story, we have this, this species that grow like crazy. You now we have these pine trees that grow, these, uh, these, these plants in the in water, these, these vines. We have all these, pla all these plants that grow a lot. And of course, my pine trees that really encroach into this dry area and become a big problem. They change it from a grassland to a forest. We also know that for many species, they're expensive and, 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 and hard to manage them. You know? like you can even cut them and they come back or you cut them and they like evolve into the, the system evolve into something different. It's, it, 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 it's very complex. So some people have, have been thinking, hey, why instead of fighting plant invasions, species that plants that thrive, uh, why we don't use them for carbon accumulation? Now we, we have like these, these trees that grow in grasslands that are like could be considered machines that, that sequester carbon. So why we don't these plants go and help us fix the problem? Like it's a win-win. And, and this is happening already, you know, like for example, in New Zealand, like the, for carbon credits, sometimes they, they can even pay you to keep the invasion. Now you have like a like a tree invasion and they pay you to keep it for, for not cutting it. So like invasions are, be, are being um, kept, uh, carbon sequestration. But this idea to me is very um, problematic. You know, like my point here on this talk is to highlight the problems of this idea of allowing invasions to be used for carbon sequestration. Then perhaps the most obvious problem here is fire. We have like things like fires, but the white fires in forests that, that, that are really terrible. You know, like we, we see it in the in the in Western US, you know, in, like in Canada, in, in, in many parts when there are like many when there are trees, they burn and they they could they, they create like many problems. We have we have we have done research on this, showing that of course the amount of fuel and chances of uh, risk of fire is much higher when you have a tree invasion than when you have like a grassland, you not know? like in this case, a step, like a dry grassland. So like the amount of fuel is much, much higher. And of course the fires affect carbon cycle, but also people are livelihood, you know, it's not nice to be like near a wildfire. So this, they have like pretty deep uh, implications. And another problem is albedo. I, 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 don't, I don't know if you know what albedo is, but it's how much light is reflected on a given surface. And you can see here on this graph, on the on the y-axis, we have the albedo grasslands tend to be more more whitish or, or yellowish than forests. Forests tend to be like much darker, so they absorb a lot more light. So they make the world technically warmer. This uh, makes some like a small difference, but at the global stage, makes a huge difference. And if we replace grasslands for forests, this this could become like an issue. So it's not a matter to uh, avoid. The, the, the other problem with this approach. Is water use. Trees use a lot more water than grasslands. No, like uh, 
like, like uh, one of the reasons why like it's very, very cool to be in a in a forest is that is, is that is that uh, because uh, they are like evaporating a ton of water to keep the system cool so like, they are like sucking a lot of water uh, to, to keep the system cool and also to grow so in my opinion the biggest pro program on, on the planet to fight a major species called the working for water program which is in south africa they basically have the people that are paid like thousands of them going with a machete or a chainsaw and going and cut trees and they cut trees because like trees use a lot of water and water is a, a super important resource in like many parts of south africa so they call this invasive uh, tree control program like i work for water because like the trees suck a lot more water than the uh, shrubs or the grasses, grasses that they have uh, the, uh, the other problem is soils and, and, and this uh, for many is really like uh, surprising many of these like, trees that, that invade have something called like ectomycorrhizal fungi associated with them and they are really good at at, at uh, mining uh, carbon from the soil so uh, they, they are they go after like nutrients and in that process they break complex mo carbon molecules and make soil carbon much uh, less abundant and, and soil carbon is the main uh, storage of carbon that, that we have on land so uh, by reducing soil carbon, uh, like they are having a huge impact on the global amount of carbon. So uh, this is like a big problem. It's not, it's not, it's not everywhere, but at least with pine trees in the areas we have studied them, their reduction could go from 10 to 15% in the soil carbon. It's huge. Of course, the other problem is species richness or diversity. And I, I can show you graphs like these ones that, that we have produced, show, showing that like native species, a native ecosystems have like many more species, but also like I can show you these pictures, no? And like, uh, and this is from Brazil, one of the most diverse grasslands in the planet. And, and if you have a, um, a invasion, richness goes really down. This is in Argentina, the same thing, really poor. So overall, there are the many different factors that are really affected when you allow trees to grow. It could be invasive trees or even plantations in areas uh, where they didn't occur naturally. So we have things like fire, uh, albedo, diverse soil carbon, etc. And I'm not saying that, that the invasions cannot be a solution for this, but they can also increase the problem of, of climate change. So we need to really to think carefully about this. And we see all the time, you know, things like, for example, if you take a plane, you perhaps pay like 50 bucks and you, you can claim that your tree has, that, you, that, that your flight has been like carbon neutral. And we see this with everything nowadays. And, and, this, and this is based on this like billion trees programs, three trillion tree programs, like 11 billion tree programs, like trillion tree programs, you know, like they really like it. We are planting lots of trees in areas where trees didn't occur literally to uh, fix this in the hope that we are doing something good for climate change. We perhaps we are not doing it. So like to close with a tweet that we did a few years ago, climate change is a huge problem. Like invasive species are also a huge problem, but we shouldn't not fight climate change by uh, promoting invasions. This uh, in most places is a bad idea. And with that, I want to thank you and I will be happy taking questions. That was really great information. Thanks you, Dr. Nunez. We have time for one quick question, and that is, what about situations where forest regeneration is being prevented by invasive grasses or sh shrubs that may be sequestering and storing less carbon than if the native forest was able to regenerate? Yeah, no, for sure. Like, I'm not, I'm not saying that trees are always bad. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a tree hater. I, 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 I like trees. But Sometimes they can be a problem. Sometimes they can be great. So my point here is not that trees are always good. Like we need to evaluate case by case. And sometimes they can be amazing. Sometimes they can be like terrible. So we need to evaluate all the cases, which are not the same. Yeah, as I would say with everything with it, like in ecology, you know, like things are a lot like case specific. Fabulous. Uh, lots of <laughs> lots of support and. <laughs> uh, kudos for that. And uh, yeah, for a great talk. Thank you again. We'll need to keep moving on though. And so we'll shift to our third lightning talk. And I am pleased to introduce Dr. Nayani Ilangakun from the University of Colorado Boulder, who will present on remote sensing for invasive Asian management under a warming climate. So my name is Naini Ilanga Kuhn, and I'm from the North Central Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Network and Earth Lab from the University of Colorado Boulder. Thank you for the opportunity to talk today. And my topic is remote sensing for invasion management under warming climate. 
So I'm presenting the very preliminary work that we are funded through the USGS to understand the innovation in the forested ecosystems. And we have three different major questions to the uh, NCRX that we are answering. The first one is what species and ecosystems are most threatened by the invasive species in the North Central, North Central region? By the North Central region, we are covering seven states from um, Montana, Colorado, uh, Wyoming, and the North and South Dakota, Nebraska, and Kansas. And the second question is that what invasive will be most important to manage in a changing climate in the region? And also like how do wildfire climate invasives interact in the North Central region? And what is the potential for ecological transformations? So the figure in the right shows that one of the management challenges that we did to the NCRS uh, about the invasion, and this shows the cheat grass invasion in the sagebrush biome. So it's mostly like within the Wyoming, Montana, and Colorado, but not in the eastern states. But this is only one invasive species in the north central region. But there are a lot of other different invasive species in the region. So in this project, we are mostly focused on the forested ecosystem. So the earlier figure that I showed that the invasion of the cheat grass, so the grass fire cycle and the invasion of the uh, invasive species in the dryland ecosystem is uh, mostly well understood but the invasion to the forested ecosystems is not well understood um, especially like a uh, few different reasons one is there are different climate variables that we have to include especially like the invasion in connection with the disturbances and the fires within the forest ecosystem are not well understood one reason is that the if we think about the climate, the variability of the climate in the past and the future is so much different and there are a lot of variability happens. And so there are a lot of other management practices that we have done in the past and there are a lot of other tactics that we are doing current and in the future and then how that these two together, the climate variability and the changes in the management practices, help the fight with the invasion or the, that some of the management practices may promote the invasion as well. For example, when we think of the fires in the West, there are a lot of management practices happen like the forest thinning, like the mechanical and other different types of thinning. But sometimes that thinning practices may also open up places for the grass occurrences and that may also like trigger some of the fire cycle. So how that is connected and how that is promote or decrease invasion has not well understood. Uh, so in this project, we are trying to understand the in grass invasion to the forest ecosystem in connection with the uh, climate change and also the management practices. And our approach is to use the remote sensing because remote sensing provides a homogeneous data set that can cover like a larger spatial scale and also the time series. So we thought connecting those information potentially would help us to better understand the invasion in the North Central region. And in this project, we are trying to address that invasion at different spatial scales at the state level, ecoregion level, and then the management polygon scale, like what ecoregions and what management are units or the uh, types that uh, would help to fight the invasion in the forested ecosystem. And also the other thing that we are trying to understand is like the recognition of invasion before happens, being proactive than the reactive. So like we are trying to use remote sensing data sets to better understand like, in ecoregion and the management polygon and also state level where the invasion happens and can we recognize with these data sets before it happens and also to connect that with the invasion potential across different climate variables and also the different disturbance types and finally we are trying to understand through the invasion what is the impact on the carbon storage in the forest ecosystems in the north central region so this is our uh, proposed workflow to do this. We are trying to use remote sensing data sets like MODIS and Sentinel data sets. We selected two different data sets at two different spatial resolutions. MODIS at the 500 meter spatial resolution and the Sentinel at 10 meter spatial resolution. We choose those two different scales to better see which uh, spatial resolution would probably give us the more information because like when we recognize different invasion plants, it may not have abundant in that place that may not be good enough to uh, recognize as an invasion through the remote sensing signal. So we thought we better uh, use the two different scales and see which one or uh, both, uh, in combination of both would help us to understand the invasion. And then, so what our approach is like, um, 
we have a series of workshops that we are planning doing and we had one in last December. The intention of having those workshops is bringing these stakeholders and researchers to best understand where the innovation have already recognized and use that information with the remote sensing data to connect those two to find the signals of the transformation. And to measure the carbon, we use global ecosystem dynamic investigation, uh, the biomass data, and connect remote sense like um, the temporal signatures from the modis and sentinel to combine that with the carbon data and develop a machine learning model. So the JEDI data is from 2019 to 2023. We have some JEDI data, but that is like a very short period. But we don't know how the carbon uh, storage changed through the invasion in the past. So what we are trying to do is use one-time JEDI data with the same time MODIS and uh, Sentinel data and develop a machine learning model to connect that spectral signature of MODIS and Sentinel to, to match the carbon. And then back in time, because we have Sentinel and MODIS data back in time, so we can map the carbon change over time to the time series. And that will help us if once we recognize where the transformation has happened through our workshops, we can see whether there's a difference in carbon change over those transfer locations. And then we can map especially continuous maps where the invasion potential in the North Central region and how that might change the carbon storage in the region. So we have colored the steps here that we are planning doing in this project. We had our first workshop uh, in last December, and we brought lots of scientists and researchors, and they give us information on the ecoregion level, what type of the um, transitions that they you know, witnessed, and what the connection between the climate indicators and the topographic indicators, what promotes or decreases the transitions, and also some of the information about the ecosystems before the transition happens. And so we also, in the remote sensing data sets, we have recognized, and these are the uh, these are potential indicators that could show us uh, the invasions based on the from forest grass transitions. And we are pl planning deriving these indicators from those data sets across the region. And these are only like two data sets that we currently investigating. One is the maximum temperature anomalies and also the, the fire the, from the MTBS data sets. Those two data sets will help us like the what's the connection between the temperature differences and also the fires that both could potentially uh, promote the transition. In addition to these data sets, we are getting the precipitation data sets, the drought indicators as well to, in connection with the transitions because like transition can happen in two different ways, the fast transition and the slow transition. The fires can promote the fast transition from frost to grasslands, but just in droughts without no fires still can have some slow transition. So we are trying to recognize both in this region. And once we have recognized spatial and temporal continuity of those data sets with the remote sensing data and also the fire and drought indicators, we are uh, developing a, a vulnerability index and then mapping through that vulnerability index that in space we can find at pixel scale which pixels are more vulnerable to trans transition. This is one of the products that we are planning providing. So the, this is the JEDI workflow that we are planning using like machine learning. We are trying to connect the one-time biomass data to the, the same time MODIS and Sentinel uh, signals. And then when, because MODIS and Sentinel have the time series, then back in time, we can uh, develop a biomass product and that could help us to better understand the change in the biomass as a result of the um, ecosystem transformation from forest to grasslands or shrublands. This should one figure that how the biomass can change with the JEDI data when the fire happened. So then the left figure shows like before and after a fire, how that biomass have changed. And then the right figure shows that from the JEDI data, the total tree biomass at the current stage in all these states in the megagram per hectare. So Montana and Colorado has the highest biomass, tree biomass especially. And this one shows like the tree cover and the grass cover change across those seven states from 1985 to 2023. And this data is from the LC map data sets at 30 meter spatial resolution. And it shows that there are some humps and dips in the time series where in some states the tree cover has increased or decreased and the grass cover has increased and decreased. There might be a connection between the disturbance. So we are trying to uh, connect this one with the climate and the disturbance and see whether this tree cover change and the grass cover change in connection to in spatial locations as well. So we can see like where that transition has happened. 
But this is the one thing that we are next trying to do is using the man management of Polygon, see like how the biomass have changed with those different practices. And then how that can help to better understand that which management practices good at different ecoregion, different forest systems to combat with the invasion. And so the two different things that we have recognized that we need to combat. One is the recognizing the tipping vulnerable forest. And this is the next one is the increased variety of management practices to cope with that variability conditions. So this is the last slide. So to finish up that I have several questions for the audience and I am happy to take any questions. So these are the things that we would love to hear from anybody interested in joining this one. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Naini. A uh, really impressive project. There is a question for you in the Q&A. Uh, we don't have time to have you address right now, but if you have a chance, you can go in to respond to that and post some great questions for all of us to maybe get back to you on. But we do need to move on. So thank you again. We're going to now shift back into the animal world here, and I'm happy to introduce Dr. Toby Zong from the University of Toronto. Scarborough, whose presentation will cover how climate change can exacerbate ant invasion by unleashing indoor populations into outdoor environments. Hello, everyone. Thank you for listening to my presentation. So almost everywhere, you can even find them in your home too. And today I'm going to talk about how climate change is going to affect some of these indoor ants allowing them to expand or spread towards outdoor habitats. Okay, so I will start with some really basic statistics. So this is a greenhouse in a botanical garden of the UK. And in the UK, we have so far recorded at least 58 non-native ant species. But 51 species only have indoor records. Now, indoor records can be from different kinds of buildings, including greenhouse in botanical gardens or agricultural greenhouse, but also residential buildings or warehouse. So a natural question from these statistics would be why there are so many species restricted indoors? Why don't they just spread towards the nearby outdoor habitats? So in the literature, the literature often cites that climatic conditions outdoor may be too harsh for some of these non-native ant species. And that's why they are just remaining indoors. And indoor environments are highly controlled in terms of light temperature and also humidity. So my research will test this hypothesis, whether indoor environment act as microclimatic bridge has for uh, non-native ants, and whether climate change facilitate non-native ants spreading into outdoor environments. So to test this, I use three kinds of data. The first one is ant distribution data set, which is global in terms of spatial scale. The full name is like global ant biodiversity informatics. So for each species, they indicate whether the region is within its native range. And if it is within the introduced range, which is indicated in red here, whether they have outdoor populations or indoor populations only. So regions that have outdoor populations would be in dark red and regions that have indoor populations would be in night red. And then because I'm interested in the effect of climate, so I also obtained the climatic conditions, both future and current climatic conditions. And I also have the impact data for different ant species. So because I'm also interested in what will be the consequence of this potential spread into outdoor environments. So I downloaded a recent study that tried to score the environmental and socioeconomic impact of different non-native ant species. Basically, if they have higher score, it means that they have higher environmental and socioeconomic impacts. So let's start with some basic global patterns. So this is a map showing the number of species restricted indoors in each region. So the region in red means that there are more species restricted indoors. Now you can see that regions like Central Europe is, has a lot of species restricted indoors and also to a lesser extent like Eastern North America too. But basically you can see that only tem temporary regions in the Northern Hemisphere has the most indoor populations. 
And you can further compare it with the outdoor non-native ant population map, which is shown in panel B here. And you can see that the two figures are really similar. For example, like in panel B, you can see a lot of the tropical regions actually has a lot of non-native ant species outdoor, but then they don't really have any indoor ants or non-native ants restricted indoors. So then we just focused on the indoor ant pattern, and then we tried to look at the effect of temperature and also precipitation in determining whether an ant is restricted indoors or whether it, it can use outdoor habitats. So what we found is that if an ant is from a warm region and then it gets transported or introduced to a cold region, then it is very likely to be restricted indoors. But if it is from a cold region and then it gets shipped to a warm region, then it's likely that they can survive outside. And there's also another scenarios, like if they get transported into climatic region that have similar climate, then it's very likely that they can survive outside as well. So we also we only find the effect of temperature being important, but not really precipitation. So then we also conducted some climate change projection based on two degrees Celsius warming and four degrees Celsius warming scenario. Now the four degrees Celsius warming is less realistic, but then it tells us like what will happen if all countries just keep just do business as usual, keep burning fossil fuel and don't do anything about climate change. So you can see two figures here. But basically, like in the two scenarios, you can see that Central Europe will be the most affected because you can see it's in red. Red means that there will be more species expanding towards outdoor habitats if they are based on indoor species. So Europe is pretty red and also to a lesser extent, North America too. So regardless of the two warming scenarios, Europe seems to be the most affected. But if you compare across the two scenarios, you can see that if we somehow manage to keep warming extent to two degrees Celsius, then the increase in almost all regions will be less uh, severe compared with the four degrees Celsius uh, warming scenario. So this kind of tells us that if you can control climate change, this can also help us like, minimize the problem of biological invasions, at least through controlling indoor populations. And then we are also interested in the effect of this potential spread in terms of environmental and socioeconomic impacts. So if you look at this figure, you only need to pay attention to the length of each bar. Don't worry about the number next to the bar, it's not that important. So the bar will be longer if the indoor species across the world are strongly associated with that impact category. And also if these indoor species can spread outdoors under climate change. So for environmental impact, you can see the bar for competition is the longest for both warming scenarios. This means that a lot of these indoor species that are expected to do well under climate change are often observed to be strong competitors. So it's likely that if they are introduced the outdoors that, or established the outdoors, they will increase competition in the native ecosystems. And for socioeconomic impacts, a lot of these ends have been found to increased crop loss or lead to infrastructure damage when they actually manage to establish outdoor. So again, that the spread of indoor populations might lead to increase the socioeconomic impacts. So just some quick conclusions. So I think my analysis showed that, that indoor environments can act as microclimatic bridge has for ants, at least especially for those that are from warm environments and they are trying to invade cold regions. And also climate change is predicted to facilitate the, in, the indoor ants spreading outdoors, which can potentially enhance the negative impacts. And I would just like to end a, with an open question. How should we manage indoor environment? Because I know a lot of us work in different kinds of habitat, but I think there are a lot of cool and important research that can be done for indoor environments. Maybe we can further identify what indoor environments are more heavily invaded or maybe a lot of people spend a lot of time in indoor environments. So some participatory science program may help us to identify or like at least monitor non-native species in indoor environments. And maybe we also need to strengthen collaborations with different parties like botanical gardens because they have a lot of greenhouses or even pest control companies given they work a lot in indoor environments too. So that's the end of my presentation and I would be happy to, to answer any questions. Thank you.
Thank you, Toby. Wow, that was really fascinating, thought-provoking, and also making me want to go check my kitchen to see if there's some ants <laughs> crawling around there right now. We are just about the end of the time period and we're a couple of minutes behind. I don't see any questions immediately in the Q&A, but if you have a chance to check there again in a minute or two and can respond to those on your own. Um, thank you again. Excellent talk. We will now move into our last lightning talk of the session. And it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Wong from the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection whose presentation is titled Invasive Animals and Plants in Massachusetts Lakes and Rivers, The Fact that Climate Change Has Changed the History of Invasions. So my topic today is about the invasive species in region history in Massachusetts lakes and rivers. I still want to thank the organizing committee who did a great job to have this amazing conference. Thank you so much. So well, my talk is about lakes, rivers, invasive species in Massachusetts, right? Many of you, especially those international attendees, may not know Massachusetts well, but you should know Boston, the great city of Boston, right? So in terms of history, I want to give you a little bit of history about Massachusetts. In 1622, remember, the pilgrim came here with the Mayflower. That's the first original settler to North America. That's in Massachusetts, the Plymouth. Okay, then 16 years later, the earliest North American College, Howard, was established. But that is another great historical event. The risk, the Northeastern region risk, was established in 2016 by Tony Lai, uh, Bethany, and Kyrie. So, sounds like today we have six risks already. Maybe because of this international conference, it can spread or <laughs> expand to other countries and uh, other continents. But go, come back to the topic very quickly. So invasive species in Massachusetts, I classify them to three categories. First one is the bottom in the water. Second one is those submerged and then floating. And the last one is out of water, but still in the water, but the emerging. Okay, so number one, Asian clam. Number two, zebra mussel, Chinese uh, mystery snail, and also the northern snakehead, the, all those in the waters. Submerged, we have, let's say, here eight species. I don't want to talk uh, anymore, but we are going to cover later. Okay, for floating, we have the yellow floating heart, water chestnut, water hyacinth, the emergent invasive species, we know the beautiful <laughs> purple lustrous, also the phragmatis, right? So when they come here, the first one recorded is 1831 the purple loose drive. The second one is 1832, the yellow floating heart here in Massachusetts. And the third one was the chestnut, 1840s. But then the fourth one is a, a curly leaf pond weed found in 1880. But well, we don't have to go to this one by one because this, you are not going to remember all those years, you know. But what I can show you is that look at the history back to 1620 when the pilgrim arrived at Massachusetts, right? So until the first established uh, invasive species before uh, 1900, the, we have six invasive species here. And then between 19 to 1970, we have another five invasive species established in Massachusetts. Okay, so now you see it's easy to see the order when they come here, right? So basically before like 1970, we have 11 species in Massachusetts, okay? So then, since 1992, we have till 2009, when zebra mussels were found in Laurier Lake in Massachusetts, we have eight invasive species in Massachusetts lakes and rivers. Okay, so so think about that. It's a very simple mathematical uh, uh, calculation, right? So the first 370 years, we have 11 invasive species. Then the last 20 plus years, we have eight. So you can see. There are so many more invasive species in terms of the past 20 years or, uh, or to 30 years is so faster than before, right? But more important, I want to show you here is that for the first 11 species here in Massachusetts, only one, the South American waterweed is a tropical species. But this species is very interesting because around 1900, it has been naturalized in almost every single continent except Antarctica area. But look at the recent eight invasive species. Four of them are from tropical or subtropical areas. 
Okay, so here's the four uh, invasive plants here. The first one is water hyacinth, which basically is a, a South American uh, uh, species, the tropical area. Okay, first one here in 1992. Okay, then the European water flower, a first found in the Tonte River watershed in 1994. Okay, then Hadrilla historically is the southern U.S. species, but it's found in Massachusetts in 2002 in the Cape. That uh, pond is called Long Pond. Okay, so the fourth tropical species invasive is called Pirate Feather. Okay, you know it's it, it's very popular for decoration for aquarium. It's also a South American invasive species, but now you can find from North America, Asia, Australia, and so on and so forth. What was found in 2006 in Jones River, again, is in Plymouth. Okay, remember that's where the first settler, the pilgrims came. Okay, so look at this one, this guy. This Asian climate is not tropical, however. You look at the history of Asian climate in North America. Since first found in San Francisco area, 1938, and before 1970s, nothing could be found north of, let's say, Philadelphia or that area. Because at that time, like 1970s, 1980s, people said the class cannot survive north of New Jersey because it's too cold. Yeah. So then later, not like 1980s, 1990s, people said, no, clams cannot survive in Massachusetts because it's just too cold for them. But look at what happened. In 2017, how many clams are here in Massachusetts? A lot. Here's, here's a map. But what's interesting is that even a lot, still most of the sightings you can see is in southeast of Massachusetts. Basically, the temperature is higher than the northwest. Okay. So, but there are still more coming. Okay. Like uh, 2021, one in Pittsfield. Okay. Then 2023, I got two reports in the Connecticut River. Basically, now more to the northwest. So, definitely something going on here. Why? Why tropical uh, species can, why, uh, can, can, can be successful now? Well, the reason is because winter time in Massachusetts is becoming warmer and warmer. So we know that, you know, that's the topic of this conference, right? So basically what happened is that among the, the eight new invasive species, four of them plus the Asian clam five are tropical, subtropical, or now becoming established very well in Massachusetts. So not only they have a high rate into Massachusetts, but among those new invasives, mo uh, most of them, more of them are from tropical and subtropical area. So it's not surprising, right? Because we have so many smart people doing this modeling, like including almost everyone I heard this topic, all the modeling, all the predictions, you know that they are coming to the north or south, to the po basically the pole area, right? So that's the climate variable is the primary predictor for invasive species uh, spread or, or range shift. So we know that. Well, so uh, look at the past two days presentation. I said, oh, wow, now we're going to see so many more, so many more, right? But if you want, want more in invasive species in Massachusetts, take a look at my new book about this 19 invasive species. You have more questions? So here's my contact. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, and I've got it right here. We're so honored to have you as our final speaker, and I have your book in my hand. <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Me. So there's a question for you in the chat, and I think if you can just write your answer, that'd be awesome, because sure, we're rolling into the finish here. So thanks, okay. good to see you, David. Super, thanks everybody for all the wonderful reactions. So we're closing out, we got five minutes. Again, I'm Tony Lynn Morelli, and yeah, we did it. So don't leave. I only have a few slides. I'll probably still get you out a minute early. I just wanted to share our success here. We're very happy. Again, like having a meeting, huge, huge meeting like this, we really didn't know how it would go. We went with, the, as we said, Field of Dreams strategy yesterday. We were saying, if you build it, maybe they'll come six months ago said, I bet we could get a thousand people here. And we did. I think we have more than 1100 that showed up. We'll get to you the final numbers. It's so wonderful to have everyone here sharing so much great information. Thanks to the last final five speakers. Thanks to Paul Heimowitz for leading that moderation. So we had a fantastic plenary and keynote speakers. Peter Snow and Helen Roy were here today and we're so grateful. Jennifer Grunson, 
Jessica Hellman yesterday and all the speakers yesterday. We had a great session today on management success stories. Sometimes they were stories about how awful things are, but we kind of kept each other going. And you know, the hurricanes that hit Florida, we've had talks from all over the place talking about the struggles, but also the wonderful successes sometimes. So we all felt a little bit heartened to hear from Dr. Bio about how we can also see some wins. And then we had research lightning talks. Before we did, we had that whole session on islands. And we were in particular thinking about that with what happened in Hawaii last year and that really coming together of invasive species and climate change in the worst way. And we really thought, let's really highlight islands. So we're so grateful to all our co colleagues who came from all over the world to share that with us. So yeah, we closed out with all these awesome research lightning talks. So great, so much information. All the great talks you heard today and yesterday, we will have those recordings available. Thanks again to our organizing committee, Giancarlo, Seha, De Dia, Elliot, um, worked so hard to bring this meeting to you. To the partners that were willing to put their logos on this thing when it wasn't a thing yet. <laughs> so we're really grateful to them and NASMA and all the help and the structure that NASA and support that NASMA provided. Check out the risks. If you hadn't heard about them before, you've heard about them now, go to risknetwork.org. If your region isn't there, your country isn't there, tell us, tell somebody, let's start a risk. We're spreading, as David said, <laughs> around the world. And then finally, I just love, love all this positive responses people gave to this question of this work is so hard, you know, you got to do something and community and small victories keeps us going. So we'll see you next year. If any of you want to organize it, let us know. And here's a survey. We'll send out the link again. Maybe somebody can drop it in the chat. Here's the Menti poll again, in case you wanted to make sure you were heard in that and you hadn't already. And um, just grateful to all of you and we'll see you here or somewhere next year.